Good morning. My name is Jim Lewis. Uh, I work at CSIS. Uh, thank you for coming to our event today. This is the second one of these we've had on uh, DNA forensic sciences. Um, the first one was uh, almost as packed as this one. We have a busy schedule, so we want to go ahead and get started. One reason I wanted you to sit down is so I could see if we needed more chairs, and so I see we're, we're close. Um, you have an agenda. Uh, what we're going to do is turn over the opening remarks to Ken Krupa, who's the Deputy Director of Defense Forensics, and then Ken will introduce uh, Ben Riley and Paula, our two following speakers, our two keynote speakers. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, Jim, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you all coming here. It uh, looks like a very good uh, turnout. Um, and then also the opportunity to really, uh, I thought we put together a pretty good uh, group of dynamic speakers here, uh, to um, not only speakers, but two panels to talk about privacy and information sec security. Not, not only that, but the emerging technologies and how biometrics and forensics is really uh, caught, caught wind and there's uh, is really doing great and wonderful things, not only for the Department of Defense, but also for the uh, protection of the homeland. So just a couple of things I wanted to, uh, I know you have the agenda in front of you. I just want to note, uh, we're going to go through a couple of keynote speakers. And then also uh, we got the coffee break at 9.30 to 9.45, give you an opportunity to um, mingle around and have some discussion with your, your peers and stuff. So. So what I understand, we've got a lot to do, a uh, short time to do it in, so I just want to get started if we could. So it's my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker and highly renowned visionary within the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, Mr. Ben Riley. So Mr. Riley, is, as you know, is the principal deputy for the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Rapid Fielding, and he really, his responsibility is focus on the policy and oversight of fielding these types of capabilities. Uh, that counter unconventional and time-sensitive uh, threats. So he he's facilitates the rapid technology transition with the Department of Defense. They look at a very short turnaround time to get capabilities out to the field, and he does such just a great job of doing that, uh, not only working with partners within DOD, but with our foreign partners and interagency partners, the academia and industry. So he does a great job with doing that. So, sir, uh, thank you again for coming, taking time out, and the podium's all yours. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm Ben Riley. As Ken said, uh, I, uh, he gave me some prepared remarks, which I'll put aside. <laughs> but uh, one, of, one of the reasons we do these conferences is, um, and I'll go into a little more depth in a minute, in a bit here, but uh, some, uh, about 2004, we really started to look in the department at, at biometrics and then I would say subsequently forensics. As, as, a, uh, as a military capability that we could apply on a battlefield. Uh, the real genesis of it came about uh, with uh, uh, the improvised explosive devices that I'm sure uh, many of you are very familiar with. And uh, <clears throat> at a point, a realization that we had, uh, as we exploited these uh, devices forensically uh, with our partners from the FBI, and, and now also now within DOD, uh, <clears throat> that we had fingerprints on these, we also had individuals in detention and we had taken fingerprints on these these individuals and I had asked the question uh, well could we match the fingerprints off the latent IED the latent IED prints to uh, these these guys we have in detention to see whether we have any matches and at one point I had a senior guy tell me we don't do that stuff that's police work we're we're soldiers marines and the like and uh, I remember a British military historian Sir Michael Howard saying the only thing harder than putting a new idea in the mind of a military man is taking the old one out. Uh, <laughs> and, and so it was a challenge to start until we, uh, we caught our first guy in late 2004 and it went from we don't do this to why don't we have more of this stuff and, and it turned around. Somewhere in that period uh, I was invited over to DHS uh, to give a talk. Uh, uh, they had some conference, uh, international conference with about 60 attendees on biometrics and I was the lunch guy to talk at lunch and the talk went fine. And at the end of the talk, like any talk, there was, uh, do you have any questions? And the first guy, hand went up, and the first guy stood up and said, so how much information do you collect on the American citizens, and what do you do with it? And, and it was kind of, for me, as though I were hitting the head with a two-by-four, because it was a realization that if we did not get out in front of and discuss publicly the issues of privacy and civil liberties and the fact that we follow the law and the policies 
as we go through these, uh, this development of this capability that we would very quickly be short uh, shut off. And so many of the things that our office does, uh, both on an interagency basis and uh, in coordination uh, with military, is ensuring that we operate within the confines and the boundaries of the law and, and within public policy and support the policies put forward uh, uh, it within the government. And uh, <clears throat> we've been assisted in that uh, with, with other interagency partners, most notably the FBI again. But uh, that, that kind of is how we got into it and why uh, sessions like this were important to me. So we address these, these issues up front and uh, not be accused of more or less putting these things under the bushel and hi under a basket and hiding them. Uh, by way of background, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, my office in, in OSD, as Ken said, is focused on uh, fielding uh, what we call fieldable prototypes, rapid fielding of new capabilities, uh, trying things out. Uh, many of the programs we do are fairly small in size and scope um, by DOD standards, certainly uh, a couple hundred thousand here, a couple hundred thousand there. This particular program started with a $600,000 investment to MIT Lincoln Lab and Dr. Bernadette Johnson, who is uh, today, I guess, the C chief technology officer. Uh, came to me with, I have an idea. And so we tried this idea out, and I sort of thought to myself, yeah, right, we'll, we'll be able to do this. But in, in fact, we've been quite successful. But there's a bit of risk in there, but a bit of capability. But uh, by way of background, uh, I was a, a Navy officer and charged with this. And as we looked at the challenges, first in Iraq and subsequently in, in Afghanistan, Clearly, there was a large degree of counterinsurgency and the elements of counterinsurgency in this. And as a Navy officer, I'm not ashamed to say I knew nothing about counterinsurgency. Uh, so to help myself out, I sat down and read as much as I could on, on the topic and uh, read both the classics, uh, which I'll quote you from in a second here, and also read modern writers, uh, John Noggle, uh, Dave Kilcullen, and others, and have subsequently worked with a lot of these guys. And if you, if you read these things, you find recurrent themes throughout them uh, it's, it, in counterinsurgency campaigns. It's, it's, the solutions are political, economic, social. Uh, much of the work that our soldiers, Marines, and others have to do is more like police work than it is than it is kind of standard combat. In fact, I have a, somebody brought me a, a bag of toy soldiers, plastic toy soldiers, like the little lead ones you used to get. And some are red and some are green. And it says, the bag says, Good old commies versus good old USA, and, and there's no ambiguity in those toys. There's either good guys or bad guys, and, and that, in fact, is the way we'd like combat to be. But we, we understand and we know quite clearly today that it's much more ambiguous and much more, uh, much more vague in, in both uh, the nature of the threat and others. So we, uh, you know, we've, we've invested in a variety of these areas, uh, and I read a lot of these things, and these recurrent themes come forward, and I'll quote one. Uh, from uh, a French author, Colonel Roger Trinquier, who was uh, in the French military. He uh, fought in uh, Vietnam with the French, uh, then he fought in Algeria with the French. And uh, his book is entitled Modern Warfare, published in 1960. Um, and uh, in fact, he says, in modern warfare, the enemy is far more difficult to identify. No physical uh, frontier separates the two camps. The lines of demarcation between friend and foe passes through the very heart of the nation, through the same village, and sometimes this divides the same family. It is a non-physical, often ideological boundary, which must, however, be expressly delineated if we want to reach the adversary and defeat him. And in fact, later on, he talks in, in a p few pages later about uh, an, an identity card uh, which which mapped a person to a specific region of a city that they used in Al Algeria. And so when folks first came to us talking about the ideas of biometrics, it was it was Colonel Trinquier's words and approach that came back to me. Uh, we had updated it from an identity card to fingerprints, and, and modern processing had let us do that. But that was that was kind of the background that I, I focused on. Uh, when we first started doing biometrics, uh, there was a thought uh, the FBI uh, collects fingerprints to a certain standard, and many of the military folks we, we worked with said, we don't need to do that same standard because uh, we have a different objective in mind. Our objective is to catch uh, bad guys, uh, and, and their objective is to take uh, arrest somebody and take that person to a court. And, 
court of law and uh, you need rules of evidence and, and so on. Uh, but one of the outcomes of a successful counterinsurgency campaign is to establish the rule of law in a region. And so more and more as we started this, we don't need to do the same thing the FBI does. We, we move to the point we need the same rules of evidence. We need the same chain of custody. We need many of the things that they have. And even in Iraq, uh, Iraq was developing a court system and had judges, and those judges wanted similar kind of evidence, maybe in a different standard, but we, we found within the military that we needed to establish those same kinds of protocols and procedures that the FBI had, although on many occasions we might not be able to do it, but nonetheless that should be our objective. And so a couple of the discussions today will focus on the capabilities that really, uh, in this particular kit, that really get to that point, and uh, I, th I think it's an important point to make. Uh, Forensic background, uh, forensics kind of trailed uh, the application of, of DODs, um, of, of our employment of biometrics, and, and brought us to move beyond fingerprints to many of the other typical forensic capabilities that we're all familiar with. And in fact, uh, preceding this, but today DOD has uh, four different forensic labs, uh, one uh, focused on, uh, on uh, uh, cyber crime with the Air Force, uh, cyber forensics, I should say, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll let Ken or others go through them in more depth, but uh, one of our big partners in this project has been the uh, Office of the Provost Marshal General in the Army, and specifically the Army Crime Lab at Fort Gillen, and, and my, down in Georgia, and my visits down there, it, it always seemed to me that a lot of their forensic applications, although they do a fine job, have been focused more on on, uh, on typical criminal activities that one might see and not necessarily moving this forensic capability forward as a battlefield capability. And so the introduction of this kit uh, that you'll get briefed on plus uh, forensic labs that we have deployed forward have enabled us to bring a lot of this typical, very traditional forensic capability uh, into uh, the military battlefield environment. Now, uh, I think most of us know that forensic labs are pretty high-end capabilities uh, with very, very talented people in them, and that's a difficult thing for us to deploy, also a very expensive thing, and so it became one of the rationales behind what we're doing uh, with this piece of equipment right here. Um, and uh, Ken gave me some target goals here. Uh, one of the goals is reducing cost, and he says a current operator costs three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. A forensic scientist, our goal is fifty thousand. In other words, you can take uh, any any uh, moderately trained what fifteen or twenty minute training period uh, soldier, give him the training, he can operate this piece of equipment. Uh, we have a goal of uh, a current sample cost about. $600, our goal is to bring it down to $25, that's work in progress. And uh, um, the cost per kit is, uh, goal is, a, what's this, about 250000 The goal is 25000 The goal is 25000 so I, I view what we have here uh, in what we'll talk about today and this piece of equipment is kind of a rabbit, if you will, that I hope will stimulate uh, the rest of the marketplace to chase this and 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 do continual improvements in this area. So, uh, while it's quite a remarkable piece of equipment, it I think is only the start of uh, what will be a, a significant technology development in in the future. Uh, just just one final thing. Uh, one of the things that we have been very uh, focused on in this effort, and we owe a lot of thanks to other partners who've helped fund this including people within uh, the Department of Defense, notably the Joint IED Defeat Office or organization, uh, but the FBI, uh, Department of Homeland Security, National Institute of Justice, all who have put money in, uh, NIST who's helped in the standards and so on. We owe a lot of thanks to those people who've, who've contributed a lot to, to the uh, effort. But uh, one of the big things that constantly amazes me in the work we've done in the area of biometrics and I think in this forensic activity will move in the future is the amount of information sharing we've done uh, with information. Uh, John Boyd, who's here, our Director of Defense Biometrics, cites the fact that in 2005 we shared one biomet DNA, uh, biometric file with the Department of Homeland Security. 
notably U.S. visit. Today, it's upwards of thousands per day, and, uh, and that only grows as we find uh, with this kind of amorphous threat that Colonel Trinquier talked about, uh, people who might have uh, uh, been involved actively, say, in IED activity overseas and now decide they want to come to this country either because they're tired of making IEDs or because they want to come here undercover. Uh, and, and so can we use our information to help people like DHS, uh, State Department, and others catch these guys, or the FBI, obviously, uh, before they get here? And so this business of information sharing of the, of the data we have is not only directed through presidential directives, but also through uh, uh, just common sense, I think. So uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting course to watch this go from uh, I have an idea uh, to where we are today, uh, but I, I sort of hope and think it's only the start of a, of a broader push to uh, streamline this technology, drive the cost down, and obviously there will be significant uh, implications not only within the DOD but across the various uh, law enforcement communities who, who have helped uh, support this. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paula, Dr. Paula Pami pamani -Yaus. I know it, Paula. Dr. P. Dr. P. Uh, who is working the program now uh, since Bernadette moved up, and Paula will give you uh, a more detailed overview. You want to? Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Paula Pamianowski. It is a bit of a handful, but you get used to it quickly. Uh, I'm from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and I'm currently serving as the principal investigator for the ANDI program, ANDI standing for the Accelerated Nuclear DNA Equipment Program. This is a rapid DNA analysis for human identification development effort which means I'm going to explain very simply, as simply as possible, it's not at all a simple process, what we're doing when we analyze DNA, and then use that to motivate you why we needed to go to rapid DNA analysis. I'm going to explain why the government uh, was interested in developing this capability. Uh, actually, you've already heard a fair amount from Mr. Riley, so I can go a little more quickly in that regard. Uh, but I'll explain about the rather unprecedented consortium that the government brought together to bring sufficient resources to this issue. And then I'll explain a little bit about the current prototype uh, that we have brought uh, for you to see here today, sitting in the back of the room, uh, and then turn it over to the panelists. With DNA analysis, you know, we're very interested in specific regions on the human DNA. Now, to start, one of, one of the things that's a little alarming about Andy is the name nuclear in the title. The, nucleus, it, the nuclear here really refers to the nucleus of a human cell. And within the human cells, you have your entire genome, your double helix uh, DNA uh, molecule, which is there. What we do is we analyze a very small fraction of that DNA. Now, we all know that we have genes within our DNA, and that's what codes us for uh, the things that make us us, our traits, uh, our physical traits, our race, our ethnicity, our susceptibility to disease. Now, these are things that we're very concerned with uh, for the privacy of the individual. We don't want to get information uh, in that regard for the individual. So we're interested in analyzing non-coding regions which is great. We have about 95% of the DNA to work with in that regard. But you need another characteristic. These regions have to have uh, variation between individuals. You need to be able to discriminate between individuals as you analyze their DNA. Now, over the last 10 to 20 years, the science has developed and been adopted to look at what are called short tandem repeat markers. Now, you see here a sequence of letters. Uh, your DNA is made up of four, your nuclear DNA is made up of four different nucleotides. These are just molecules that are strung together along your DNA. And these short tandem repeats have the characteristics that they have well-defined flanking regions. You see them here in green. And within them, you see a particular sequence of letters. In this case, the sequence is GATA. And for this example, you see it repeats 12 times. 
Now what you do is you look at a population and you say, well, how often does somebody have a 12? In this particular case, it occurs about 42% of the time. So you already have a little bit of discrimination between you and someone who doesn't have a 12. But we inherit half of our DNA from our mothers, half of our DNA from our fathers, and things are paired. Our chromosomes are paired, which means you inherit one copy, one variant, which we call an allele, from your father, and one copy from your mother. All right. The frequency for each allele is, should be statistically independent, uh, at least to the largest extent. And so those probabilities will multiply. If you have a 12 from one parent and a 13 from another parent, in this particular case, uh, you would be with 6% of the population now. To gain further discrimination power, we interrogate multiple DNA locations. The standard has developed. Uh, the FBI uses a standard set of 13 uh, loci, locations on the DNA, that they interrogate. Now, the probability of just randomly matching all of the alleles across uh, 13 loci is about 1 in 5 trillion. So you see we're already to the point where we're beyond the population of the planet, and if you have a very good uh, high-yield DNA sample, you get excellent discrimination power if you can analyze these 13. In practice, they use another three locations to look at. Uh, one of them determines gender, and uh, there are two extra ones. Now, the gender helps in the case of rape, uh, being able to deconvolve the samples. Uh, and then also for forensic cases, you might have a degraded sample. Uh, having a couple of extra alleles helps with the discrimination power. At the end of the day, you've really only looked at about three thousandths of a percent of the person's DNA. And again, it's all non-coding. There's no information um, about the person's physical or biophysical traits. So why do we need to change things? This has been in practice for many, many years now, and it's working quite well, except in one regard. It takes a very long time to do this process. It's a very complicated, wet, biochemical uh, process, typically done by very highly trained technicians. So just to walk you through a little bit, why does it take so long? Well, you see there's a suite of uh, different pieces of equipment that need to be used. Samples need to be moved throughout the process. And in total, it takes about 10 hours, typically now. Uh, the first step is you need to extract the DNA from the nucleus of the cell. You need to purify it. Uh, there's a step where they actually determine how much DNA is present in the sample. You need to make sure that there's enough uh, to move forward with the analysis. This is uh, very critical in the case of forensic uh, sample processing. Then the regions of interest, these STR markers, need to be copied. You need to get a lot of statistics. You break them apart. Uh, and make multiple copies. And then finally, you need to uh, separate out the different fragments, these pieces you're interested in, and then detect how many repeats each one has. At the end of the day, well, at the end of 10 hours, you end up with a file that looks like this. This is what the trained analyst can look at. Uh, here you see all 16 locations separated out nicely. Uh, there's two peaks at each location, again, one from each parent, unless you get the same copy from each parent, in which case you have one peak, but it's taller. On the lower left, you see that this person is an XY, that means he's a man, contributing the sample. Now, this isn't the information that you need uh, to really identify the person. You can now just report 32 numbers, two numbers for each of the 16 loci. So it's a very small bandwidth file that needs to be sent around, matched to other um, information you might have in a database somewhere else. And because it's just very simply numbers, it's very easy and unambiguous to do the matching. So 10 hours just to do the biochemical processing. But on the front end, you first have to get the sample from wherever it was collected to the laboratory, these centralized laboratories. And depending on where you're operating in the world, this could take days, even months, uh, to get the sample out. On the back end, you have to match your profile against a national database, for instance, the FBI's database or other databases that the DOD might hold. And uh, it's typical to, or it, it, it's, you can have processing backlogs in that regard. That can be hours or even weeks if um, you're not a high priority uh, analysis. 
So the idea here is the operational community really needs to shorten this timeline. You need to be able to get an answer out uh, that matches the timeline of the operation in hand. If you're holding someone, you'd like to get an answer before you release them and they go to ground. Uh, so the goal has been set to try to get the processing under an hour, deploy it out to the field, proliferate uh, a lot of these systems, have them used by easily trained operators, uh, and then make sure that you get the answer in the time window you need. This was a tall order from where we are today. Uh, and the government began, various uh, organizations within the government had begun funding uh, the development of rapid DNA. Uh, however, no one organization had enough resources to bring to this, this problem. The Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, who are your hosts today, uh, put together an unprecedented consortium that combined the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, and Department of Homeland Security efforts. Ultimately, seven sponsoring organizations were brought together. Uh, you see the list of them here. We have uh, our a few of our sponsors here today, like Tom Callahan from the FBI, uh, and Chris Miles, who's one of your panelists from DHS, Science and Technology Directorate. Uh, their goal was to develop a common core instrument. No one would get exactly what they wanted. Everybody has different mission needs, but the idea was this instrument would serve as the foundation for agency customization. It was a long path to get this program stood up. Uh, basically, ASDR&E worked for about a year and a half with its technical advisory panel uh, to set up this program. Lincoln Laboratory came on board uh, as program integrator and system architect. You know, Lincoln Laboratory is a federally funded research and development center. Uh, we're independent, we're not-for-profit, and we have a charter with the Department of Defense to not compete with industry. Originally, it was planned that Lincoln Laboratory would build the equipment in-house. We are a research and development prototype house. Uh, however, we first conducted a survey to look at what commercial technologies were out there to see if we could leverage what was already out there. Uh, the results of the survey came back uh, with our recommendation that the government could accelerate the development of a rapid DNA capability uh, by, uh, by submitting a, a subcontract to industry and basically having industry put their resources against it. At this point, the, the uh, consortium was stood up. All of the stakeholders pulled their requirements together and a prioritized list of what um, could be gone after easily was put together. Uh, and then the uh, competitive request for proposal was issued for the hardware subcontract. This was awarded to NetBio, um, who's here today uh, with the prototype that they've since developed. So the program kicked off back in October of 2009. And as it was uh, called Andy, again, Accelerated Nuclear DNA Equipment. And the hardware goals was to get the processing down to one hour or under one hour. But the, the samples that they were going to process were a reference sample. So basically, you have the person in hand. You take a swab, typically, of their cheek cells. There's a lot of DNA there easily uh, taken just by a cotton swab. Uh, it was decided that it was a bridge too far to go immediately to forensic samples, low yield, maybe degraded samples, uh, samples that are left behind as people touch objects of interest. Uh, so the idea was let's first go for the reference samples and then we could do a spiral development to start looking at forensic samples. However, to move towards forensic samples, there was also a portion of the program that Lincoln Laboratory undertook to look at how much DNA was left behind on objects of interest, so that way we could set the requirements uh, for this next stage of development. Uh, now, all of this has to be used by non-technical users in deployed facilities. Uh, and so with that regard, also, you have to communicate back to the databases. Uh, there's a, a secure data communications and processing piece that Lincoln Laboratory also took on. Uh, Tony Lapidula, who's one of your panelists, led that effort, so he'll be able to go into more detail than I'll give in this talk here. Now, this, the goal was to have five prototype instruments delivered in 18 months. So that's 18 months from October 2009. We're about a year behind on the development, but uh, we're doing really well at this point. 
Once the prototype was developed, uh, the idea was you now need to understand how well does it meet the operational goals of the various sponsors, uh, and then this will drive the next cycle of development to get a more capable, more advanced DNA analysis platform. All right, very simply, in three steps, here's what the instrument and the process looks like. You know, as I mentioned, you swab the inside of somebody's cheek, uh, and then that swab is inserted into what's called a biochip set. Now, these biochip sets are single-use consumables. They're designed to, have, uh, to process five samples at one time. So that's five different individuals. You could, you could get their DNA profile uh, along with a, a ladder reference, a Lilic ladder reference on board. What's very innovative about this is that all of the wet biochemistry is on board this biochip set. It arrives packaged with all the re reagents on board, and they're uh, stabilized uh, by design to be uh, good for at least three months at room temperature. Now, this alone is a, is a huge enabler for removing that highly trained technician from the step. Uh, you unpackage them, and you put the swabs in, and you're ready to go. All right, the uh, biochip set is then ins uh, inserted into the instrument, and again, you can see it in the back of the room. It's about the size of a large microwave oven, and that's because we were able to make use of, of a microfluidic approach. Uh, basically, no fluid is shared between the biochip set and the instrument, which keeps the possibility of contaminating samples down. Um, but basically, the instrument provides air pressure to drive the fluids through a very complex series of channels and... and um, and gating uh, to move through the process. It also couples electrically, electric field, as well as with heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. So it drives the process, but it doesn't interact with the sample in any real physical way. Here's a picture of the, the biochip set from the top. You see where the swabs are loaded uh, into the top chamber, the five different swabs. Uh, you see the pneumatic interface is labeled. There's a clamping arm that comes down and couples with that pneumatic uh, interface to drive the samples through. And basically, you know, the biochip sets, a, you know, will fit into a shoe box. It's about that size. But all of those different pieces of equipment really are on board on this biochip set. Uh, this region here you see is where the DNA extraction and purification takes place. The sample is then driven uh, to the area labeled in, with pink uh, where the STR markers are copied. Now, one thing that it doesn't do at this point, because, again, we're going after just reference samples, it doesn't do the quantification. So we don't know how much DNA is present, but we don't need to because uh, with the buckle samples, you have too much DNA. You actually want to downsample the amount of DNA you have. So if we move to a forensic capability, uh, that's going to have to be integrated into the system. All right, if you now look at the bottom, and again, this is a very a sandwiched layering of different channels. It's a very complex piece of equipment. Uh, you see where the separation and detection occurs. Basically, you now have these different fragments uh, that you've made copies of. Uh, they, you pass them through an electric field, which causes them to um, straighten out, basically. There's a sieving matrix that they pass through. The short ones reach their first, basically. The long ones reach their last, and um, ultimately you, they go in front of a laser interrogation system, which counts, you know, allows you to count how many copies you have for each of the STRs. So all that's done on the biochip set. It really is easy to use. Uh, I show a couple of pictures here of Lieutenant Colonel Scott Jackson. He's a U.S. Army fellow at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. He's an infantry man. man. And uh, with very minimal training, we showed him how to load samples, load the instrument, and then look at the results. Uh, it's very easy to use. We've had a prototype instrument in-house at MIT Lincoln Laboratory since the end of December. Uh, we are now currently doing integration testing with it. We, right now, we have it with um, a prototype biochip set. Ultimately, we're going to move to injection-molded uh, plastic for the, the biochip sets, and hopefully we'll begin testing with that in April. So that's our last gate before the sponsors uh, can take acceptance of them if these new biochip sets work appropriately. What we do see from our independent testing of the instrument is that it can produce STR profiles of quality comparable to traditional laboratory equipment in 94 minutes. 
uh, and this is very good for the program. The goal was set to an hour or under an hour. However, uh, it was decided that quality was more important than timeliness because 94 minutes is still uh, an incredibly short amount of time to do this processing. So the quality is, is looking good. Now, once you produce these profiles, you need to be able to handle them securely. And the architecture that was stood up looks as followed. It has to be easy to use, uh, again, by a non-technical user. That's critical for adoptability by organizations. It's also very important to understand who's using the equipment and what they're doing with it. So the person has to log in so you know who the person is. They need to have a, a smart card with their own uh, personal identity verification information on board. The software is designed to basically digitally sign that information every time a change is made. Right? So you know who was interacting with a file and what they were doing. The original copies of all the information are saved. Right? So if somebody tampers, you can go back to the original file and, and you have that accountability. And then finally, uh, the information is, is encrypted and decrypted at each step. Right, so the Andy instrument produces the file, we bring it over to a separate laptop tablet, uh, and we do all of the data analysis there. There are two software packages that go with Andy, again, to make it easy to use. I showed you an electropherogram with peaks. The, the idea is a non-technical user really shouldn't be looking at that. All they should be doing is saying, okay, I generated a profile, do I match to a suspect? So there's a program called STR Match on board. Uh, the DOD needs us to be able to quickly look to see if someone they have, say, in a holding facility matches uh, somebody on record. Maybe you have a local watch list that you're comparing against or to format things appropriately to send to a national database. Right? So the idea is, again, get this answer into the hands of the operator before you need to release that person. And the other piece of interest primarily to the DHS is to look at whether family, stated family relationships are indeed verified for immigration purposes. To prevent fraudulent claims, basically someone coming over, an asylum seeker bringing over someone who is not in truth a family member, uh, the idea here is you want embassy personnel or other people working in immigration to be able to really look to see if this family relationship is verified. Now, STR profiling, as it's currently done, really only allows you to look at parent-child relationships and to see if they're compatible. Uh, there's no other capability. For instance, you can't tell if a sibling, two siblings are related to each other just because of the way the statistics work. Right? But by bringing this equipment forward to, say, an embassy, to a refugee camp, uh, you can do it quickly. You can really shut down. Uh, cut down on the amount of interviewing, paperwork, all of the things that have to happen, and sh ultimately shut down a potential path for illegal entry into the United States. So what we have today is a prototype that we're currently integration testing. Uh, as soon as that's completed and the instrument's ready to go, the five instruments will go to the different sponsoring agencies. Uh, three of the instruments are slated to go to the Department of Defense. One will go to the FBI. One will go to the Department of Homeland Security. And they're going to begin independently testing the instruments. They're going to, however, make use of uh, NIST's going to be providing uh, standardized samples for everybody. And the goal is for everybody to share the information from the testing. So that way you get even more statistics on how well it operates and what issues and concerns are. The DOD then needs to think about operational validation. They need to see if it can operate in operationally relevant environments. Uh, some environments could be quite harsh. You don't want to take it someplace where you'll instantly break it, for instance. Uh, and then again, as, as Mr. Riley said, you know, this is being used, will be used for evidence uh, in military operations. So there has to be some level of validation testing to make sure that the quality of information coming out is compatible with that of traditional methods. Uh, on the civilian law enforcement side, you know, there's, there's a, a very stringent validation testing, uh, which could take a fairly long amount of time. You know, and making sure that the policy of using this particular device, this particular capability uh, in national uh, law enforcement, civilian law enforcement, is appropriate. So there's a long path um, before it really gets out into the real world. 
Uh, to summarize, the Field Deployable Rapid DNA Analysis Consortium was stood up to develop this core capability for rapid, accurate human identification. This grew into the ANDI program. We now have a fully functional prototype that has demonstrated fully automatic processing of samples in 94 minutes. The quality is comparable to traditional laboratory equipment, and it is easily operated by non-technical personnel after only a minimal amount of training. Uh, the program's on path to delivering the five fully functional prototypes with injection molded consumables to the sponsoring agencies in April 2012, so that's coming very soon. Uh, we're conducting a very extensive test suite to make sure that the performance of the instrument and its operational utility is sufficient prior to field deployment, and then the system will undergo validation testing prior to evidentiary use. That's all I have for you today. And Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Dr. Pomanoski. Did that right. Okay, so what I'd like to do is um, we're going to go on a brief br brief break. I'd like to break now, uh, come back. Uh, the schedule says 9.45. So I'd encourage you to go, go back. We have the Andy equipment on display. There's a couple posters that kind of summarize uh, some of the key events, some of the privacy and the information sharing things. So I'd encourage you all to take a peek at that and uh, to interact. So... See you back at uh, 9.45. Well, welcome back. I know one of the important functions of events like this is to give people a chance to uh, mingle. And we'll have another one at the end of the uh, panels we've got for you. The uh, two panels we have, one on privacy issues, one on the information sharing environment, both crucial issues for this. Um, this is the second one of these events, I think, as I mentioned, we've done for uh, Ben and his team. And the first one was really kind of neat because that was when, uh, starting with uh, some of the data they were getting off IEDs, they found they were able to do matches between the people who built the bomb and then the people who were applying for entry to the U.S., applying for jobs at <clears throat> U.S. military facilities. It was really kind of cool. And when they said that to me, I thought, hmm, this is really going to be interesting. And one of the things that you might not have seen a link to is that Shortly after DOD began this program a few years ago, that was when many countries in the world suddenly decided it would be useful to fingerprint people when it came in, when they came in to, for a visit. That's when the European Union flopped on fingerprinting. So there's real effects on the advent and the use of this technology. But there's real issues, too, and I think you can all think about them. We're in a borderless kind of conflict to the extent there's people out there that we need to find. Uh, some of the individuals we might be dealing with could be U.S. citizens. I know that's been one of the concerns all along, um, that you'll collect data and it will turn out to be a U.S. person, and that creates all sorts of issues. We have this larger issue, and it will come up in the second panel on information sharing, too, on just the ubiquity of data and what are the rules for the treatment of that data when it concerns individuals who are either U.S. persons or non-U.S. persons. So, uh, complex set of issues surrounding a very valuable technology. We have a great panel to talk about this. I'll just read their names and titles. Their bios will be available on our website. Uh, Jill Spriggs, who is the chief of the Bureau of Forensic Science at the California Department of Justice. Elizabeth Johnson, who is the CODIS manager for the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Labs. And I think CODIS stands for Combined DSA in DNA Index System. Yes. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> and um, Samuel Jenkins, who's the Director for Privacy, uh, the Defense Privacy and Civil Liberties Office. So tremendous panel to talk about this. What I'm going to ask the panelists to do is talk for you know, five or ten minutes. Uh, we'll hear their presentations, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and discussion with the four. So thanks. Well, I'm going to whip through mine. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I arrived late last night, so forgive me. I've been drinking coffee and cranberry juice, trying to get sugared and caffeined up here. Okay, so 
Um, just so you know a little bit about me, I'm the chief over the Bureau of Forensic Services, California Department of Justice. Um, I'm under the California Attorney General's Office, which our Attorney General is Kamala Harris. Um, I'm under the Division of Law Enforcement. Uh, Bureau of Forensic Services has over 400 employees and I have about an $85 million budget. We service 47 of the 58 counties in California. So as the doctor was talking, I was thinking in my head about how all or over 500 law enforcement agencies is gonna use this rapid DNA um, system, possibly when they're doing live scan. We have 10 full service laboratories throughout the state. We have latent print labs, tox labs. Richmond is our big data banking laboratory. We have data bank there. We also have casework. I'm lucky enough, I have a method development or research section, which a lot of laboratories um, do not have, as well as missing persons. We have over 2 million offender arrestee profiles. We upload about 20,000 samples per month, and we have between 350 up, upwards to 600 hits per month. Um, I also have a teaching institute underneath me and ISO accreditation. We're pretty spread out throughout California, as you can see. And one of the things I was asked to talk about was the policies the state of California has implemented that prevent unauthorized use of DNA. You can find these in our California Penal Code. This is where anyone, any person knowingly uses any of these DNA types and discloses the profiles. Um, and shall be pun punished by imprisonment in a county jail not exceeding one year or by imprisonment in the state prison for 16 months or two or three years. So you're going to have law enforcement agencies out there or possibly uh, military putting in these samples and uploading them. So you have to think about the privacy rights. Also, anybody who uses it for financial gain have criminal fine up to three times of any financial gain received or $10,000. These are just some of our penal codes. And then also any employee of the Department of Justice. One other thing that I was sitting here thinking about was when I was a DNA analyst several years ago, I did two DNA cases. Both were John Doe warrants. One was solved, one still has not been solved. So I would want you to look up People versus Robinson. That was the case that was my case. And one of the things in that particular case was the person, the offender, had an arrest on a juvenile when he was a juvenile and should not have been uploaded into the data bank. But there's a provision in the, in the code that says if you do it in good faith, it's okay. And that was upheld. So that's going to be something that's important as you have law enforcement agencies or military looking at these rap sheets. A lot of time they can be very confusing when you're looking at them. So you want to make sure that provision is in there. Okay, how were those policies were used in the aid of the Grim Sleeper case? Our policy and procedures, um, we developed th this through our familial search committee. As you probably heard, the Grim Sleeper uh, case, it was an LAPD case. It was solved July 7, 2010. Came out in the Los Angeles Times. Um, it was very public display. We have our, our now governor there, Jerry Brown, the mayor, LAPD, um, police chief, and the LA County DA. Um, we were also in the Los Angeles Times. It was a very busy week. Just so you know how this kind of came about, this picture, it's kind of funny. We were all standing in front of it, and he, in front of it, and he said, hold it right there, I'm going to take your picture. So that's why we have all the numbers all over our face. We also have another familial search that was solved, too, and this was a rape. So you have the Grim Sleeper that was many, many um, homicides. They're still finding more. This is actually a rape case that was solved. I'm going to talk a little bit about our policies. Um, our first bulletin came out April 24th, 2008, and we actually started the first case in October 2008. Our goal was to minimize privacy concerns, because you have to remember that offender is not in there to find his family member. So you always have to have that in the back of your mind. And what this is, it's just an investigative lead when we hand over that offender's name. We do not search arrestee samples. We only search offender samples. So the conditions of the policy must be met before the DOJ will release the name of the convicted offender in the DNA database who may be a relative of the actual perpetrator. And we took every precaution we could to do this. We have three criteria. It must be a violent crime. So we don't do burglaries. We don't do robberies. All investigative leaves have to be exhausted, and it has to be a serious public safety risk. 
casework conditions has to have an unsolved forensic evidence DNA profile and it has to be a single source, meaning it's one person. You have to have 15 loci. Um, so we want that because that gives us more markers to search. And we also have to have the YSTR type, which is the, your male type. Our familial search committee, just so you can see who it's made up of, we have a familial search chair, which is our caseworking um, technical lead, Gary Sims, myself, um, my DNA assistant chief, Eva Steinberger, uh, Ken Konzak, who is our CODIS um, technical leader over that system, Linton Von Berelding, and who's our state administrator, Matt Pucci, who's also in our data bank. We also have a deputy attorney general who advises us on certain issues and certain things, Mike Chamberlain. And then we also have a special agent in charge from our Bureau of Investigation, Karen Sherwood. We meet approximately every month. We just met Thursday to um, come up with our next five cases. So what we've done is we've used scientifically based procedures. You know, we have over almost 2 million profiles in there. We don't want to have a whole candidate pool of thousands and thousands of people. So what we've done is based on the Y type and the, the 15 markers that are compared to the unknown crime scene, we're searching those for the rarity of the marker. As the doctor said, in one of those markers, 42% of the population has that marker. That's not a good marker that we would want to use. So we want to use those ones. Our software looks at the rarity of those markers. So I'm, I'm kind of going fast because I've only got five minutes. So the request comes into the bureau chief. It comes into me. We, I look at the request. Um, I funnel it over to the Richmond laboratory. If it's missing anything, um, they'll ask for it. And when we meet as a committee, we go over it. We do look to see, have investigative leads been exhausted? Have they done everything they can on the case before we accept the case? We are pretty picky about the cases that we, we take. So remember, we don't search arrestees. We only search offenders. The first search was that actual Grim Sleeper case on October 27, 2008. We got our ranked 200 uh, convicted offenders. We did Y typing on those 200 and compared it to the Y of the crime scene sample. No match, in particular, to the Grim Sleeper case. So, but let's say on the next time we did it, a year later, just we always search everything every year. We always send out a letter and ask for another letter to search. In this particular case in the Grim Sleeper, Lonnie Franklin's son had been put in, in the system in that year. So we had a Y hit. Once we have a Y hit and it matches that Y against the unknown crime scene sample, the committee meets. We meet and we round table the hit. We look at the date of birth. We look at the race, if we have anything that knows any, in our documents from the investigation, the race. We look at everything. We go around the room and we vote. Are we going to hand that name over to our Bureau of Investigation to investigate? And we, we go around the room, yes, yes, yes. At that point, we hand it over to our Bureau of Investigation. They go and they actually do a, a family tree. So in the Grim Sleeper case, they looked at where did the, did the offender's father, was he still living? And was he in the area? Was he living in California at the time of all these crimes? Yes, he was. He ended up living two to three miles from each victims where they were dumped. So we look at all of that. Comes back, they write a report that's about this thick with a lot of documents that go with it. They come back to the committee and they, we vote again whether or not to hand over that name to law enforcement. And when we do, we make it clear that it is a, only a lead. Our software looks at parent, child, sibling, sibling. Um, that's usually the relationship that's gonna come up with our software. We also ask that a detective be there when the, when the uh, committee meets with the law enforcement agency to give them the, the a lead. Also a DA representative and the crime lab di director. And we make it clear that it is an investigative lead. We also make sure that it's very clear that the named convicted offender is not the source of the forensic unknown DNA profile. We also talk about the results provide, provide an indirect association based on potential genetic relationships rather than a direct match. Does not confirm that the named offender is biologically related to the source of the forensic unknown. Our uh, computer software is best explained by parent, child, and sibling-sibling relationships but other patrilineal relatives could exist, such as uncles. 
no match. You get a letter from me saying there's no match, but to send me another letter in a year, and we will go ahead and research. So one of the things when, this, when the Grim Sleeper first came out was the skeptics about invading the privacy of people. And I think one of the things, um, the ACLU's comment that was in the LA Times, July 10th, 2010, from our perspective, if you're going to use familial DNA searching, this is the kind of case you should use it for. Remember what we use it for. It, it has to be um, a violent crime, violent case, public safety risk. This is the kind of case you should use it for, and the kind of precautions they took in this case are the kind that should be taken. We took every caution there was, and remember, this is just an investigative lead. This was our attorney general at the time, Jerry Brown. Now he's the governor. This arrest proves proof positive that familial DNA searches must be a part of law enforcement's crime-fighting arsenal. Although the adoption of this new state policy was unprecedented and controversial, in certain cases it is the only way to bring dangerous, dangerous killer to justice. <laughs> So who pays for it? We currently absorb it um, under the Bureau of Forensic Services. We have bi-monthly meetings. We choose the next five cases. Um, we currently don't have a backlog. We've chose the five cases and we're doing it. We've completed 35 searches. Um, our new Attorney General Kamala Harris is very supportive of this. And so we're doing two searches now a month. And that's my contact information should you need anything. Hope that was not too fast. <laughs> Thank you, Jill, though. Well, it's a little fast, but if there are questions, we'll have a chance to come back to them during the Q&A period. Uh, with that, let me turn to Elizabeth, please. Good morning. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, CODIS is the Combined DNA Index System. It is a database of DNA records that's used to find matches between DNA profiles developed from crime scene evidence and DNA profiles from convicted offenders, arrestees, or other crime scenes. The goal of finding these matches is to provide investigative leads to criminal investigators. A DNA record in CODIS consists of a specimen identification number, a laboratory identification number, and the DNA profile itself represented as a string of numbers. There is no personally identifying information, or PII, in CODIS. There are no names, no dates of birth, no social security numbers. There's no specific information about the crime from which the DNA profile was developed. Control of that information remains with the laboratory that owns the DNA record. The CODIS program in the Department of Defense complies with both the DNA Identification Act of 1994 and the Privacy Act of 1974. The DNA Act restricts disclosure of DNA samples and analyses only to A, criminal justice agencies for law enforcement identification, B, in judicial proceedings, C, for criminal defense purposes for the case in which the defendant is charged, or D, if personally identifying information is removed for forensic identification research and protocol development. When a DNA sample is taken from a military offender, he or she is notified in writing of his or her right to expungement should the charges not result in conviction or should the conviction be overturned. Also, in compliance with the Privacy Act, he or she is advised of why the information is being collected and the authority that allows that collection. Before the identity of a military offender is released, a confirmation process is always applied. The identity of the offender is verified through IAFIS, the Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System. The analysis of the sample is repeated to verify that the profile involved in the match is indeed associated with that sample. Finally, the qualification of the offender is verified. Obviously, the Army Crime Lab can only control data that it enters into the database and not data entered by other laboratories. This raises the concern of data quality from other laboratories. When the DNA Identification Act of 1994 created CODIS, it also created a process for the development of federal standards to ensure quality of data in CODIS. All labs entering data into CODIS must comply with the quality assurance standards issued by the director of the FBI. Additionally, labs that participate in the National DNA Index System, or ENDIS, must comply with the ENDIS operational procedures. Together, the FBI Quality Assurance Standards and the ENDIS Operational Procedures ensure the quality of the data in the national database and give us confidence that the information we receive from other laboratories 
and, and provide to military investigators is accurate. And as we move towards rapid DNA, as you saw earlier this morning, that is our future. Uh, we expect that these same measures will be incorporated into that process to continue to protect, protect the privacy of our servicemen and women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I'm Sam Jenkins. I'm the Director for Privacy in the DOD's uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Office. I've been in that role for five years, and, um, and previous to that, I was in healthcare privacy for a long time. But in the course of my work, one of the goals that we have in my office is to help users of information, including DNA, get to the point where we can say yes to them. You can use, collect, maintain, and, and store PII, personally identifiable information, including DNA for appropriate purposes within the department. So we don't stand in front of people as an obstruction to their use of information. We are focused on facilitating the, the ability of individuals to use information appropriately in the department. And with any new technology but for identifying individuals, there are numerous privacy and civil liberties concerns that need to be analyzed and addressed. These can range from the specifics of appropriate procedures involving the collection to more abstract theoret theoretical implications of the use of particular information. At the Defense Privacy and Civil Liberties Office, part of our job is to evaluate all collections of personally identifiable information. And at a minimum, we check to ensure compliance with applicable laws, beginning with the Privacy Act of 1974. That is the core standard for our program. The fact that it was published in 1974 does not suggest that it's not a, an up-to-date law. There's a condition in the Privacy Act that requires that we establish administrative, technical, and physical safeguards about information. And by using those safeguards, we can apply policies and procedures to the collection and use of information that ensure that we follow the laws of the country. Our reviews of these systems, though, often go beyond just that checklist of regulatory requirements. Our job is to ask if proposed collections meet constitutional muster in terms of their association with the privacy rights and the civil rights of individuals who we collect information about, as well as the discussion of the ambiguous standards of social acceptance. Because as social media takes its bigger and bigger footprint in the sharing of information across the country, privacy, individuals' privacy considerations are changing in the country. So the social acceptance of how we use information is becoming important. Uh, we perform these reviews on a myriad of systems, collecting information from ranging from HR data to medical information and to biometric information. We're physically located on the same floor of a building where the defense biometrics office resides, and we work very closely with them on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to recognize that some PII is more sensitive than others. In 1943, President Roosevelt signed an executive order that said we must use the Social Security number to identify individuals in federal record keeping. In, in 1943, the consequence of the use of the SSN couldn't be forecasted. In 2008, President Bush revised that executive order to take the word must out and add the word may. And it opened the door for the federal government to officially start looking at alternatives to the use of Social Security numbers. But if you look at the history of the Social Security numbers and all of the impact the numbers have had on people's financials, their identities, and other information uh, thefts that have occurred about individuals, you'll find that over the years, those consequences increased a great deal. We have to be careful as we collect and use DNA that we don't reach a sim similar circumstance with DNA. Now, DNA can uniquely identify an individual, but it can also identify familial relationships. And I'll give you an example of one that we were involved in a number of years ago. In 2005, the DNA Fingerprint Act allowed for the collection of DNA 
at the conviction of a person of a felony. Well, we, we in the DOD oftentimes have people who are deserters. They leave their posts for extended periods of time with the intent of not coming back. We had such a, a person who was apprehended by the military re d deserter group and taken to um, a military activity up in Great Lakes, Illinois. The law at the time, the 2005 Fingerprint Act, DNA Fingerprint Act at the time, allowed us to collect the information at that point of the conviction of a felony. And the court martial this fellow would have gone before would have resulted in a conviction of a felony. So in anticipation of that conviction, the law enforcement personnel took a DNA swab and ran it. They ran it through the lab and they, they matched it to a familial match for a rape. But we couldn't let that DNA sample and its result be used in subsequent law enforcement activities about that rape because it was collected prior to the conviction and the, the Marine was never convicted under the court martial. As often happens in, in DOD and in the military services, they are discharged with a less than honorable discharge, which is a lifelong penalty in and of itself. But he was never officially convicted. So the sample was collected inappropriately and should never have been run, should never have been collected in the first place. In 2007, the law was changed to allow for the collection at the point of arrest for um, crimes that would result in a felony conviction. And we've worked with uh, Elizabeth Johnson and her group and others in the department to make sure that we are collecting that information appropriately and using it in appropriate settings, including having instructions provided to individuals on how they might expunge their records if they're not convicted. So um, significant concerns exist regarding DNA collections for law enforcement purposes. Um, Concerns arise when DNA is collected at the point of arrest. To begin with, we have to ask what the individual's rights associated with that collection of their DNA at that point are, and do they have rights. And what we've done in the department to meet that challenge, as I just mentioned, is if an individual has a DNA sample taken at the point of arrest but is never uh, taken to a trial and convicted of a felony, or if the charges are dropped or they're released without charges, we have to have a means of informing the individual that they have a right to request that their records be expunged of that DNA sample. And we have done that by providing instructions that are included in the DNA sampling kit that are given to the individual at the point of collection. In addition to the, the information that the Privacy Act requires that we provide them the authorities and the purpose for the collection of the information at the point where we take the swab. So we have worked very closely with, with groups throughout the department to ensure that we are meeting both our Privacy Act requirements and focusing on the rights of individuals in relationship to that collection. There is a concern about the, the collection of information by law enforcement. The, the state of New York has announced that it's going to collect information from all people convicted of crimes, including mis misdemeanors. And while New York argues that such a widespread conduction, co collection will save lives, one can help but wonder if such a low standard of DNA collection might infringe on an individual's rights. After all, collecting DNA from people ticketed for speeding would undoubtedly solve other crimes, but it would also create a national database for drivers. Uh, there's needs to be clear and distinct policies and laws that define how a sample is used and when it is warranted for collection so that we protect the individuals that entrust us with their information. And then while technology has not yet enabled instantaneous DNA collection, the capability for that as we've seen today certainly exists. And we're going to get to a point as technology advances in the future that we're going to shorten that 94 minutes down to something very much less than that. So that kind of technology coupled with stops and checks, you know, the, the police stops and checks that they use often do for uh, drunk drivers and such uh, screenings might create an, an, inv an invasion of an individual's privacy 
and might step on civil rights that the Constitution guarantees for individuals. And so we have to be mindful as we collect information about the rights to privacy and the civil rights and civil liberties that are afforded to individuals by the Constitution. So I'd like to thank the Centers for Strategic and International Studies for inviting me to participate today. I'm looking forward to interacting with you as we go forward today, and I thank you very much for taking the time to come and listen to us. Thank you. Did we have microphones for questions? I think while we're getting the microphones, I'll go ahead and maybe start to warm things up. Um, fascinating presentations, especially some of the case data. Um, let me start by asking all three panelists uh, sort of a basic question. We have, as you heard in the last presentation, you know, a framework of privacy laws and privacy rules. Can we just extend them into covering practices with the new technology with DNA, or are there places where we need to either modify them or come up with new rules? I mean, what, what's the ideal privacy framework for this new technology? And I know it sounds like one of the, some of the presentations we've heard, there's been a fair amount of progress, but you know, when you look at this, what do you think we need? Um, what is it that we have and how would you change it? Uh, Jill, do you want to start or is that, sure. Well, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm not an attorney. Um, I think a lot of the policies that you have now in place are good. Um, I would start by looking at them to make sure that they fit all of the necessary things that you want to do with this new instrument. Um, you've got the misdemeanor issue where you're going to have law enforcement agencies that want to start their own misdemeanor databases. Um, we have a, a similar program in Orange County in California called Spit and Acquit. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Um, where Orange County, if you're con uh, convicted of a, a misdemeanor, if you give them a sample, they'll um, take away the misdemeanor. Um, so you're gonna you're gonna have to look at all those those different levels. Um, you're gonna ha you're gonna have law enforcement agencies out there and personnel. Um, also, when I was looking at the penal codes, you know, one of the things for financial gain and all of that, you're gonna have to make sure that your backgrounds are done very good on these law enforcement officials. Um, I can tell you with my own bureau, I review the backgrounds. I only pass about 50% of the people. Um, due to such things as drugs, finances, um, prior work history. So that's going to be another place where you're going to need to look. So I think you're going to have to look at uh, doing a whole overview of everything before you actually would, would roll this out. Um, one of the other things I, I talked to um, the doctor about is, you know, we only search every Sunday. So if you have a law enforcement official that's uploading this sample, it's still going to stay in a, in a file and only be searched every Sunday. So are you going to be able to search faster right away? Um, and how is that going to work with Endis? So those are just some of the things that I, I can think of. Great. Thank you. I'm not sure about spit and the quit there, but it's an interesting program. Uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> What happens when somebody refuses to spit? Is that a confession of guilt? Or? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I guess my comment would be on the fees. Um, we are making the DNA process. Is that better? Thank you. Um, my, my comment is regarding the speed of some of these processes. As I described during our confirmation process, we verify identity through fingerprints. We verify uh, offense information either through our DOD systems or through NCIC. And if we are getting to the, the point where we can do the DNA in, in 90 minutes uh, and do the search instantaneously, which you, we're, we're not there yet, uh, we're going to need to do some of these verification processes up front. Um, and I, I think that's something the FBI is, is looking at and could perhaps comment on. Um, we want to do that fingerprint search and verify identity before the sample is collected and run in the Andy, as well as offense verification. Those steps need, need to be completed prior to the DNA analysis in order to really get the, the savings of time that comes from this rapid method. Sure. There's, there's one other thing. Currently, when you have a hit in a crime laboratory, so you, you have a hit to a convicted offender. 
we go back and we re-pull that sample and we rerun it, run it to make sure there's no mix-up as we also verify a thumbprint. And then we don't consider those convicted offender arrestee samples coming in the, in the door as evidence. So that's why we ask the local law enforcement agency to go out and collect their own sample. So in this case, are we going to start considering these samples evidence? And are you going to be able to go back and verify that particular reference sample with a thumbprint once you have a hit? Your turn. Um, under the Privacy Act, we are required to uh, provide public notice to individuals who we intend to collect, to collect information from, and DNA would be one of those collections of information. We have to, to publish these notices in the Federal Register. Now, granted, the majority of the public has no idea that the Federal Register exists for this purpose, but it is our means of, in, of informing the public and being transparent to the public in our collection and use of this information. We also use the system of record notices that are published in the Federal Register to help guide our operators and users of information in our systems associated with that information to understand the limitations on how that information can be used. And so as we go forward in collecting DNA, for various purposes, we have to be very clear in, the, the, in defining the purpose for which we collect the information. And if we're going to collect information for one purpose and anticipate using it for another purpose, the, we're going to have to go back to our public notice and revise the purpose statement to ensure that we include new intended purposes for its use and we need to identify uh, particular authorities in the federal government that allow us to change that purpose. And then we have to train and make our operators of our system aware of the privacy requirements inherent in these collections and use of information to ensure that we are collecting it at the right thresholds and for the right purposes so that we don't infringe upon individuals' privacy rights. Great. Um, given that the was that a question? I didn't want to. Given, go ahead, please. Who are you addressing? Uh, Me? Okay. Well, I, I, it, it's covered to the missing persons, I believe. So it's not excluding it. Okay, given that the purposes that um, uh, DOD might have in collecting this data uh, will not be the same as the purposes that a law enforcement aid, this is a little speculative, so I'm going to push the panel a bit. Given that the DOD purposes are going to be different in some ways than the purposes that a law enforcement agency might have, I mean, there'll be some overlap, but not complete, um, how much of the law enforcement precedent, which is pretty strong, how much of that is transferable to what DOD does now? Where will DOD need to think about maybe doing some different, uh, different things? Well, under the Privacy Act, we have an allowance to share information with law enforcement authorities who are pursuing evidence related to the commission of a crime by, by a particular individual. And so we do share information with law enforcement to help facilitate investigations. But again, as we move forward and we change the purpose for which we're collecting information, we also have to look at the documented sharing of that information with organizations outside of the Department of Defense to ensure that the, the purpose of their use is compatible with the purpose for our establishing the record in the first place. Uh, but we participate with law enforcement activities to ensure that criminals who do commit crimes uh, are uh, identifiable. So, so we continue to share information with law enforcement agencies. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, Jill, maybe I could ask you, how much of the data that you use do you get from places like either FBI or DOD? Is that something that you work with or is that, uh, is it? No, most of the data that we're using is through the state. 
because okay. it funnels into the FBI. Okay, so you pass it up to the... Right. right. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. elimination samples from the people who do the DNA so they can determine whether or not it's been cross-contaminated. Is there going to be that type of process in the field for the rapid DNA, number one, and number two, for Mr. Jenkins in particular, uh, what is DOD doing with Xena, which, which is a, an act that controls the um, taking of DNA samples from individuals and with respect to their privacy? Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. All right, because there's an issue within the federal government. Maybe, Jill, you know, you've done some work on that area with respect to whether or not you can take DNA from federal employees as elimination samples. Yeah, there's the GINA Act. It also goes to manufacturers of consumables. So oftentimes, or not oftentimes, Every once in a while, we'll get swabs that contain a profile that's a very low-level profile of somebody who actually made the swabs or the tube. So it's very important to wear a mask. Um, one of the things we're, we're trying to do in California is, and I pitched the idea, which I think is a great idea, sorry, even though it's my idea, um, <laughs> to uh, one of the assemblymen is, is to actually mandate law enforcement personnel as well, well as crime lab personnel to give their samples because I believe there are a lot of old cases that are sitting that are unsolved that are probably the detective who collected the sample. And so that is one area that really does need to be looked at. If I wonder maybe if Paul is still here, we could ask her, Paula Pomianowski. Um, the, what, there you are. Uh, sorry, you were trying to try, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what you do about contamination with uh, Andy? and Because that is a good question. That's an excellent question. Uh, at this point, again, with the limited testing we've done to date, we haven't seen any evidence of contamination. Right oh, Now, weird. we don't yet know to what level the instrument could be contaminated, but just by the way the processing is done, because there's less human in the loop, there's less chance for contamination to happen. But however, you know, the rigorous testing it's going to need to go through, uh, particularly the testing that will happen at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, will look at this particular device to see how well it handles contamination. Um, j just, just from being a, a DNA analyst, and I'm sure you, you, you could talk to this too, um, you know, your, your cheek cells are rich in DNA. There's a lot of DNA there. So if you have any type of contamination, it have to have to be a lot of contamination in order to see it because your DNA from your cheek cells is going to overpower any small amounts of contamination. And that's probably why you haven't seen it and you won't see it. Elizabeth, did you want to... Um, I just wanted to add, you know, I agree with that. We do see a low-level contamination on occasion in the laboratory. Uh, the GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, does contain an exception for law enforcement laboratories doing DNA analysis that allows us to maintain DNA profiles of our employees for uh, detection of contamination. And we do um, have such a program and use it in every case to evaluate any unknown profile that we develop. And for us in California, we have unions, so that's why we're not able to do it. It's very hard to get it done. <laughs> I've had a couple other questions up there. Go ahead, please. Yeah. to have, we do this, then this too, kind of a one-way street sharing with law enforcement. We can give you data uh, that you can use for law enforcement purposes, but we can't get any information back out of it because the law is so restricted. Is there a reason why, if you're not using it as evidence, the law basically states you can only use it for law enforcement purposes? Is there any uh, effort or thought or discussion on broadening those restrictions within the California law so we can use it for more uh, national security type purposes? 
are, are you are you are you speaking in regards to just our offender our samples that we collect and our SD samples? Well, some of the laws you, you said in terms of doing that uh, SDR for the match was like, well, you can do it, but only off of convicted people's bond. Uh, it only it can only be provided to law enforcement personnel for purposes of law enforcement. Access. Well, we we also only do it in our state too. So we don't we don't do any other states. We we only do it in California. Um, I, I would have to talk to you about exactly what, what you're thinking about using it for. Um, Tom Callahan is here too. He can probably help you with, with that too. Um, but right now we only do it in California. We don't do it on arrestee samples. Um, when we started the program, we made a decision not to do it on arrestee samples. California is very litigious. And so um, I don't know if you guys have heard, we've had a People versus Booza where it was found unconstitutional to have arrestee samples. Um, we filed a brief in the California Supreme Court which quashes that, so we're still doing them. But until that's all worked out, we're, we won't be doing arrestee samples for familial searching. From our perspective, when we first started doing fingerprints, basically the only matches we were getting back were in sight. Because they were the bad set with the match effect. So obviously those were collected based on law enforcement activities, but we were able to use it in an operational setting. But with DNA specifically, there's a lot of existing legal frameworks that don't allow us to, to kind of extend that same capability until we build up our own data set. Where, where exactly are you from? Uh, I work in telecom security. Okay, because we're we're in the same way. We we can't search your DoD uh, databases either. We're not allowed to do that. So I think that's a bigger, even bigger discussion. Mm. Yeah, and that's um, a hard one that uh, we talked about a year ago, and it probably didn't make much progress on. Is that what you know? Combining databases creates a whole much greater set of privacy issues, and I don't know if Samuel or Elizabeth want to add anything to that. It's a nice idea, and there's a real operational benefit, but it does raise some concerns. It, it does, because a database collecting information in the state of California and a database collecting information at the federal government level are operating under different authorities and responsibilities, and there's no clean merger of that type of information into a single source of, of query that would meet all the, the different requirements associated with the two different collections. And so I think we're quite a ways away from something that's searchable, a, a, a one-stop-all search, if you will, of information about individuals. Okay. Um, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Is that uh, no? Okay. <laughs> well, don't say I didn't offer. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, I was wondering if it's possible for an offender to, uh, to refuse to submit their DNA sample. Uh, and if they, when they do submit their DNA sample, what requirements there are uh, about what they have to be told about what the uses of that DNA sample will be, or if they're not, or if you don't have to tell them anything. Well, from a DOD perspective, we're required to inform individuals about the purpose for the collection of a DNA sample in this case, including the authorities for the collection of that information and, uh, and whether the collection is mandatory or, or optional on their part. But if it's a mandatory collection, there has to be a consequence for refusing to provide it. And we have to have that fully established so that the individual is told what that consequence might be. But uh, anyone has a right to refuse to provide information. But um, it doesn't mean that the law enforcement effort will stop because they didn't provide it. Okay. Um, go ahead, please. a DNA fingerprint and a fingerprint with respect to uh, how it's treated and should they be different? I mean, I think the reason Congress called it DNA Fingerprinting Act was the STR is chosen other than AML, which gives sex, give no personal information about a person and they are tantamount to a different kind of fingerprint. I'll take it. When, when we create a 
DNA profile and all of those coded numbers that con construct that profile of an individual, that coding is a unique personal identifier, meaning that from that code, that number, that DNA profile, we can specifically use that number in appropriate databases to identify an individual. So that is an element that is personally identifiable to each individual. I mean, your DNA mapping is only relevant to you. I mean, one out of five trillion means that we have unique identifiers for each individual. So they're probably more accurate than fingerprints themselves. So they, it is a personal identifier and we treat it as such. Because with that, you can collect from a variety of sources records and information about each individual who that coding applies to. So we treat it as pe personally identifiable information and protect it as such. No, but they can be used to, to obtain that additional information. I mean, all of that can that all that can be used to retrieve personal information about individuals. So it's what you can get from that coding. I think some of the concern comes from uh, the retention of the sample. While it's true the STR profile does not contain um, information that can be used to do anything other than un identify the individual. Um, m most people believe that, you know, as we retain the sample in the future, there is a potential to find out other information about that person, and that is really the, the big difference between DNA and fingerprints. It's the sample itself. One of the things you could say about the whole privacy concern is there maybe there's three issues that drive it. We've touched on each of them. Uh, collection, what are the rules for uh, collecting the sample? Um, use, once you collect the sample and process it, you know, what are you allowed to do with the results, right? And what are the rules on that? And then finally, kind of related to use, but and the, the issue Elizabeth jo just brought up, um, storage, right? So when you think about these three issues, um, where do you think the greatest risk of privacy is? Where do you think we should have the most concern? Is it, is it at the collection point? Is it storage? What, what, uh, if you were ranking these things, what would you say? Go ahead, and I'd like to ask all three members of the panel. What do you worry about the most? If you, when you think about your own privacy, do you worry about, I spit and acquit sounds kind of interesting, I mean, for a traffic ticket, but um, where is it the collection, which, or is it, where do you, where do you see the focus of privacy concerns? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess I would see more in the collection. And the reason for that is when you're collecting it, are you mixing up the sample? Do you have a, a thumbprint to support whose sample it is? Um, so I, w I, would, I would see it more in the collection than in the storage. And in, in, I mean, in storage, it goes into a room that's key carded and locked, and nothing's going to happen to that sample. So I would see it in collection, I guess. OK. Um, I, I agree with that. We have uh, several mechanisms in place to ensure that the DNA sample we receive does go with the individual. Uh, whose information we receive with it, um, but where we do see mistakes, they are typically at the collection point. Um, and we have several ways of, of verifying samples um, and have identified issues in confinement facilities and at the point of collection in the, the, our equivalent of booking stations uh, and are constantly working to, to shore that process up. There are very few, um, but where there is vulnerability, that, that is at the point of collection. And I have to deviate just a little bit because my concern would be in how we use the information. And we have a data repository of DNA samples um, that we maintain on military persons for the un unfortunate task of identifying re the remains of service members. But the purpose for that collection was only for identification of remains. And 
if we choose to use that information in that data collection for some other purpose, then that use is not an appropriate use under the manner of which we documented that system and informed the public. So I'm concerned that we have data that could be used for other purposes that um, could be used under the radar, if you will, uh, inappropriately. Okay. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, the um, privacy issue as it applies to collection, um, it's interesting that uh, different state jurisdictions have different um, statutes for what is permissible for collection and there's a wide variety across, um, across the United States and the federal government. So uh, perhaps half the states do permit uh, collection of samples for an arrest, including misdemeanor arrest like um, California. Uh, other states are only for felonies. Um, so the fruits of the poison tree in one state would be permissible in another state. Um, the second thing that um, you have discussed is the um, concern for uh, effective collection and storage. Uh, I don't know if anyone has mentioned or addressed um, what happens when circumstances are triggered to purge uh, previously collected or p collected DNA samples or profiles which are in databases. But that also seems to be very uneven across the United States. And um, um, I, I wanted to ask the panelists whether they're familiar uh, with how that's working. That is the statutory opportunity for privacy so that samples that should be removed from databases are done and done so effectively. Um, we, we do have an expungement program in California. We actually have an outreach um, section that, that's, that handles the expungements. Um, I can tell you we've had very few. It's a very easy process. It's on the website. Um, we made it so that anyone can do it, and it's very easy. But we've had very few expungements. Why, why do you think that is? I'm not sure. Okay. Do people know about the program? I mean, Pe People do. It's, it, it, they know about it. it. Like I said, it's on the website. But we've just had very few expungements. Hmm. Okay. Elizabeth. Okay. Um, within the Department of Defense, we also, of course, have the expungement provision that we advise people of uh, at the time their sample is collected. Uh, the instructions for how to get that are published in Department of Defense Instruction 5505.14, and that is available on the internet uh, on the IG's website. Anyone can find those instructions. Uh, we have had a number of soldiers and Marines, um, don't believe any airmen yet, um, utilize that process. When we expunge a sample, we go through the same verification process that we use for hit confirmation. Uh, we run the fingerprint, we have to verify that they have in fact had their convictions overturned or not been convicted of anything. Uh, and we also reanalyze the sample because through the expungement process the sample is destroyed and we want to ensure that we are in fact destroying the correct sample. Uh, we have had, I would describe very few, but I would say it's catching on. Um, and I, I expect because the department has a unified defense bar, uh, which makes us a little bit different from most other um, entities. Um, they share a lot of information with each other and I expect that defense attorneys uh, will share information about how to, how to achieve that expungement when, when an individual is entitled to it. And as we were developing the DNA collection policy a few years ago, we, we were very, uh, very involved in identifying this process of expungement for individuals whose DNA didn't meet the threshold for retention. And um, not only did we include information in our guiding implementation documents, but we also provided instructions in the kits that were uh, used to collect the, the samples so that individuals had two ways to find out about expunging their records should the threshold not be, meet, not be met. So we worked very closely to ensure that those rights of individuals were available to them and they had procedures and steps to follow to make those requests. This is, uh, I know we got two questions out there and I just want to ask a quick one really 
can you get your fingerprints expunged? Does anyone know? And I assume that mine, which they took quite a long time ago, are still out there in uh, well, if we, if we took your fingerprints for a background check for security clearance, those are going to retain, be retained in that file forever. So, no. <laughs> if, if, we took the, if we took fingerprints related to a background check for a security clearance, those will be retained in that particular collection forever until those records are retired or disposed of. So, uh, probably not. But if they were collected, if you're... Fingerprints were collected for law enforcement purposes, for a law enforcement purpose, and the purpose was not carried out. You have the right to request that they huh. be expunged. You always have the right to request that something be removed from a record if it's not accurate or relevant. And if the relevancy comes into play in this particular case, where if if your fingerprints were taken at the point of arrest and you were never charged with or convict, convicted of a crime, then you have the right to request that it that it, that information be removed for its in, irrelevance to the particular proceeding so you always have the right to ask state conviction is overturned, they can get that profile expunged from the national database, even though it may not be expunged from the state database. So that's, so there, we've tried to you know, model the national database on, on federal law, but I think that's an, an important point here. Um, it, it is state laws with regard to authority and operation that, that most Thank you. Um, we had one in the front. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm Lou Finelli. I'm the director of the DOD DNA Registry. I oversee the uh, service laboratory, AFTL, and the repository. So just a point to Mr. Jenkins' mentioning of the repository. We possess over 6.4 million cards, bloodstain cards. When the repository was established in 1992, the decision was made to maintain those cards indefinitely or as a medical record for 50 years, essentially indefinitely. We do have a way to uh, remove those cards if you're not subject to recall. But the point I'm trying to make is that they remain cards until they're used for the purpose of identifying the remains. Uh, there are federal laws that protect use for other um, proof of life concept, if you will, if someone was captured or whatever. I do have a federal law that allows me to process that card. Uh, but they, we do not possess a database that we can go into readily, <laughs> such as CODIS. Uh, I think we need to be clear a little bit about, uh, our colleague in the back mentioned victim identification. This conversation is pertaining specifically to law enforcement purposes. There are other uses for DNA within the federal government that those privacy questions uh, need to be addressed individually. And to where Cal DOJ is meeting and talking about it regularly, that's the sort of level of conversation that has to go on for each use. So victim identification, missing persons, law enforcement, uh, and Ken brought up uh, employee collections. It is imperative that we have a, a way to make sure that we don't have contamination in the products and for our laboratory staff. Once it's beyond the laboratory and the products that we use, the, the, the information that goes into CODIS or any of our victim identification databases is only as good as the 
way we could verify that information. So you could perpetuate a detective who in good faith tried to collect something uh, out at a crime scene or a guy down range, and if there's no way to say it's our guy versus somebody else's guy, you know, we're just perpetuating uh, you know, bad data. But the point, uh, main point I'm trying to make is we just have maintained bloodstained cards. So thank you. Did we have one in the back? Go ahead, please. Thanks. I assume that uh, not your laboratories, but other laboratories probably uh, check uh, enlistees for communicable diseases for the determination of, of fitness and, and deployment with what with a million servicemen being sent overseas. Um, and and Congress's pass, passage in 2008 of, of GINA um, prohibiting discrimination doesn't, I don't think on its face, apply to the military. The question is, are you aware, are there discussions within the military about the use of the DNA you keep on, on file to determine uh, decision, to make decisions concerning deployment of enlisted men? And as you can see the utility now that, there, now that we know what genes you know, identify type 1 diabetes susceptibility and a bunch of other things, just as you would make a decision that you wouldn't send people with communicable diseases overseas, you, you can see that many would argue that you'd want to make a decision about the probabilities of people acquiring uh, diseases and, and conditions. So the question is not whether you're doing it. I assume under the restrictions for identification you're not. The question is, are you aware of discussions within the military to use samples for those purposes? Well, when we are dealing with military members and family members who are being transferred or deployed overseas, we do a great deal of health screening to determine whether they have a disease process that can't be treated in an overseas location or would be detrimental to them in an overseas location. As example, for a, a military member with diabetes, it is very difficult to deploy somebody to a forward setting such as Afghanistan and uh, be confident that they can maintain their regimen of insulin treatments and other dietary requirements and manage their disease process, where in the United States they could potentially be assigned to a station where they could do that. But the same thing applies, to, the same screening applies to family members. We don't transfer fam family members to overseas locations where the conditions of the family member could not be adequately cared for. So we do that as a form of screening, but we don't use the DNA database to identify those processes. We do that by medical examination, physical examinations, interviews with individuals, both the service member and the family members. And the whole point of doing those screenings is to ensure that where, where we send them, we can care for them. Or where we send them, their, their particular disease process won't be exacerbated by the conditions of their, their ultimate duty station. All right, uh, we had one more question there. Yeah. I think a previous question uh, contrasted fingerprints and DNA, and I think that sort of uh, analogy breaks down uh, with familial uh, testing. So when I give up uh, <clears throat> My fingerprints, I mean, I, that is a unique identifier for me for my life. But when I give up my DNA, that might affect my children's children's children. And I guess I would wonder if, if in the expungement, if there should be a policy setting aside expungement, say on death or discharge, or whatever the, uh, you know, the uh, nature of the uh, uh, reason for collection of the DNA was. Go ahead. We have an attorney general's ruling that, um, let me back up. We have what we call a dead inmate project. So there are a lot of people who died in prison out there that had qualifying offenses um, that never were, were collected. So we had to get an AG's ruling to go back and collect those samples, whether it be from tissue samples or coroner samples or crime laboratories have um, blood, blood stains that they've had for years and years and years. Um, so we had an AG opinion, and 
it was deemed that we could go back and collect dead inmate samples, even though they're dead, which I kept saying they're dead. Um, so we have used those samples um, to solve one case in LA. Um, it was a Sacramento County dead inmate sample um, that was collected. Um, it hit on an LA County case uh, from the 70s of three uh, young men and it was able to solve that case. So that's where I know that you can use these dead inmate samples to help solve some of these old cases. Is that, if that's what you're going well, to? The question was a little different about whether maybe upon death the uh, DNA should be expunged so that the people, uh, so that the uh, inmates, children's children's children couldn't <coughs> be, uh, uh, um, their privacy might not be impacted by a familial search. That would probably have to go back to an, an attorney general's opinion also because as far as I'm concerned that sample is still a, you're still able to keep it in the data bank and use it. The Privacy Act only covers the living. So at the point where an individual dies the Privacy Act no longer provides protection of their information. It was intended to protect information of, of living citizens. You may have hit upon something here. Well, I have one final question that I'd like to ask all three panelists, and then we'll uh, do our change over here. Um, when you talk about this kind of technology, when you talk about uh, DNA sampling, generally the reaction you get is very often one of uh, discomfort, uh, particularly with the public, right? And so if you were to read the, if you were to scan the press on this, you would find a lot of privacy concerns. Justified or not is another matter. I think one of the things we've gotten from the panel today is a fairly robust set of rules on the use of this, this information. But if you were going to do one thing that would maybe lower people's concerns to the extent they have them, what would be that one thing that you would do to make this uh, something a little more comfortable for the American public? You can just make stuff up. I mean, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I think the one thing there's a lot of confusion on, on is the DNA that we use do not code for any physical characteristics or medical. And I think that there's a misconception there. Um, the thing that I would like people to know is that it, it does not work like it appears on television that you can <laughs> run a DNA sample and find out where the person lives and shops. Um, <laughs> it, it, there are great restrictions on, on what it, there's not much in CODIS that's of interest to people anyway that's all retained in another format uh, and there's great restrictions on, on who can access that information. And, and I think these things, the, these limitations on how this data will be used need to be included in those, those informative statements as to why we're collecting it, what our authorities are, so that people understand at the point of collection that it's not as you see on television, it's completely different in, in our use than what you see you know, on CSI. <laughs> well, that's a little disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's kind of a relief. Um, let's do uh, two things, if we may. We have to swap panels. Uh, that'll take about five minutes, so if you want to refill your coffee or anything, uh, plan on doing that. But we'll start promptly at uh, 11.05. Join me in thanking this panel, please. Waste basket. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. If you wanted to know about expungement of fingerprints, I built the National Fingerprint Program History System. Um, the criminal purpose is that uh, fingerprints are really used to ensure that they are not sure of criminal record. For identification purposes, uh, that is for civil purposes, it's uh, for licensing and repairing. The um, civil database at the federal level is really only on the federal employees. All of the other 
including security clearance checks, are not retained in the national database. They're returned to the contributors. There is uh, the same thicket of uh, local, uh, really state and federal laws on expungement with fingerprints and with criminal histories. Yeah, actually, it's a much richer set than that. It's for DNA because it's been around for 100 years, and yeah. DNA hasn't been around for 100 years. So it, there's plenty of provision for it. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate you on taking on a most complex challenge. I'd like to make an observation which I want to go to the general audience, but I think it's a question of what stage you serve in the survival That is, I believe, the reason being is that data warehouse Best right. at every stage. Right. I would be more concerned about the system mm. at which any data is pooled and data signature vests. Uh. Mm. IBM has created a complex, which I can discuss at another time, yeah. a way of data pooling with forms of data signature on which I develop. The system from collection means any form of inclusion, benign or adverse. And this applies throughout the international life So uh, that's something to talk about later. You might want to see if there's a point because the next panel is on information sharing. And I will. Overlap with some of these. So are we also going to just make sure you think about it? I think a way to think about some of the Think about if there's a point to inject some of this in the next panel. That would be great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what time? I, I guess we should. Uh,
Yeah, we'll just do okay, it that so way. Right. The hard part will be getting them back in their chairs. If I could ask people to go ahead and take their seats, we can get started with uh, panel two. Anybody else got a... Uh, can people get the last cup of coffee and then go ahead and uh, sit back down? Okay. We're getting there. What? No, I'm just trying to get them to sit down. Oh. Have somebody walk down the back and encourage them to sit down. Okay. Jose thinks we're going to be okay with food. Okay. Thinks that I'm yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Can we do, do me a favor and get the people in the back to I'll, sit down. I'll come down there. <laughs> At least to me, get in there. Okay. At least to me, it looks like there was a, at least a degree of overlap between our last panel, which focused on privacy, and this panel, which talks about the information sharing environment. And the information sharing environment (ISE) is a concept that's been around for a while. Uh, there's been uh, some progress in different parts of the federal government in moving this environment forward in other parts maybe a little less progress um it's a crucial point and i think we heard from uh tom earlier that uh, the ability to combine data to share data and to search data is one of the fundamental challenges for the technologies we're talking about now um, i'm going to go through and give you the names of the panelists their titles their bios are available on our website um, and then we'll go down the row and have them have them give their presentations. So uh, first is I'm, I'm going to butcher it again. Anthony Lapadula. Ah, see, I knew I would get it wrong. Uh, Anthony Lapadula, who's on the uh, bioengineering systems and technology staff uh, at MIT Lincoln Labs, right? Uh, Stephen Washington, who's the project manager at the FBI's Biometric Center of Excellence, is that out in West Virginia? Okay, well, thanks for coming in. Yeah. Um, a big center out there. If you haven't been out there, it's worth a visit. Um, Chris Miles, who's the biometrics program manager, uh, Human Factors Behavioral Science Division, Directorate of Science and Technology at the Department of Homeland Security. And then John Collins, uh, Forensic Science Division, Michigan State Police. Thanks for coming. So with that, let me turn to our panelists, and we'll get the discussion started. Thank you. So good morning. My name is Anthony Lapadula. I'm from MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Um, I'm a colleague of Paula's. Um, I was uh, and still am deputy principal investigator on the Andy Project from the Lincoln side. Um, and so Lincoln was responsible for, <coughs> excuse me, 
Um, the, the design of the software that runs on the tablet, which we'll show here, um, and also was responsible for designing the, the security architecture for the full system. NetBio was, was responsible for the instrument, both the hardware and the software that runs uh, on that platform. Um, and so what I have here, I'm sure that this isn't readable um, by anybody in the audience. Um, I have a poster and I have a, a, an, uh, an excerpt from the poster. Um, but what, what I'd like to do is to walk through the different pieces of the system and talk about the security um, features at each point. So I'd like to say that the project sponsors really stress the importance of building a secure system. Um, a lot of that credit goes to Chris Miles, actually, my co-panelist. Um, the goal is to prevent or at least discover any unauthorized access of the system. Um, the example that we always use is on-the-side paternity testing on the weekends. That's the kind of thing that we want to be able to track. Uh, you laugh, but it's been known to happen. Um, <laughs> additionally, future generations of this instrument or similar instruments might be deployed in a variety of field locations. And so we don't want to rely strictly on physical security. We can't just rely on guards and locked doors for the security of the system. And so we built a number of security features into the system. And the security features that we added are, are far and above anything that you would find on standard laboratory equipment. So we, we took our responsibility very seriously here. So I'd like to walk through uh, this chart a little bit. I'll focus mostly on the ANDI instrument itself, the connection, and then the, the tablet where the Lincoln Laboratory software runs. So to start with the ANDI instrument, um, it is running a variant of Windows 7, and so you need to log in with the username and password as, as always. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier that each of the buckle swab uh, that are used in the system have an RFID tag attached. And so that sample can be traced all the way from the manufacturer of that swab, all the way through the data generation, all the way to all of the data products that come off of the instrument. <clears throat> the STR profiles that are generated by the ANDI are encrypted, and they are stored in an encrypted format on the ANDI itself. And they're encrypted in such a way that the ANDI itself cannot decrypt them. You actually need the tablet to view and to manipulate the data. Um, and further, the ANDI instrument digitally signs all of the profiles that it generates. And that proves which ANDI instrument actually generated the, the data that, 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 uh, that is exported to databases or for other uses. So those are some of the features that happen at the ANDI itself. I'd like to talk a little bit about the connection between the ANDI and the tablet now. Um, the protocol that we use, and I'll try not to bore you with, with too much gobbledygook here, uh, the protocol that we use is, is transport layer security, or TLS. Um, and this is what's typically used to secure uh, commercial web traffic. So if you're in your web browser and you are go to an HTTPS um, URL, um, you're using TLS under the cover. So this is a, a tried and true secure protocol. Um, and it guarantees that the data between the ANDI and the tablet are encrypted at all times. Further, we have a mutually authenticated TLS um, uh, protocol used here. It means that the ANDI pre pre presents cryptographic credentials that says, I am an ANDI, and those get handed to the tablet, and the tablet has to verify those cryptographic credentials. And it's mutual. The tablet also uh, hands its cryptographic credentials back to the ANDI, and the ANDI verifies the tablet's credentials. This means that both pieces are, are guaranteed that they're talking to a trusted, a trusted system component. Um, and last, and perhaps obviously here, it's a wired connection, and that just lowers the chance for eavesdropping. There is no, you know, there is no wireless signal being sent from the, from the instrument. Lastly, on the tablet, <coughs> uh, it's also running a Windows 7 variant, and so you need a username and password to log in, as you would expect. You also need to run our software, a common access card. So anyone in the military knows what these are. This is just a, a smart card. Um, so you need one of these plus a pin that goes along with the card. And this guarantees that when you're running our software, we know who you are and what time you're using the instrument and what you're doing. Um, all of the activities that, that occur on the software running on the tablet are logged. Um, advanced users are allowed to edit the profiles on the tablet. Um, but if you do that, the, the new profile that gets generated is digitally signed um, by your, your CAC or your smart card. And that proves exactly who, who made the modification and when. Um, we, we also keep a full history of all of the edits that might happen to a profile on a tablet. So we have a, a, a strong cryptographic chain that goes all the way back to the, the generation of the profile by the Andy through any changes that might be made by expert users on the tablet. Um, so that's a summary of, of the integrated security system that's, that's present in the system. Um, that's all I have. I'd be happy to pass it along.
<clears throat> Go ahead, please. No, I think uh, you're next to you. Good morning. My name is Stephen Washington. I'm from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Clarksburg Sieges Division. Um, here to represent uh, the BTC Biometric Technology Center. Was called in on last notice, last minute notice, and uh, asked to speak about information sharing. And sure enough, coming from another location, my information didn't show up. So, <laughs> so as a result, we're going to continue to look at this device, and I'll speak about it, even though I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> with that being said, uh, seriously speaking, I'm, I'm from the, uh, as I mentioned, the BTC uh, Biometric Technology Center. Uh, we are currently constructing a new facility in Clarksburg, West Virginia, a rather impressive facility. Uh, this facility will have joint operations between the DOD, DOJ, and hopefully DHS as well. One of the concerns that we've come across is how do we share information? And so as I'm leading up that activity, I've been asked to, to come and speak to you. And so as a panelist, I'm going to do the same thing I did as a student. I'm, I'm going to receive questions, but in turn, I'm probably going to ask questions back, which is kind of uncommon for a panelist. I was about to mention that uh, I'm new to this side of law enforcement. I've been with the FBI two years, but I've been asked not to say that because every time I say new to this side of law enforcement, they keep looking for me on, on wanted posters. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'll say this, that I spent 20 years with Hewlett Packard in the IT division, developing shared information services, a lot of custom solutions for the government sector, but from a private standpoint. So with that, as a retiree, yes, I have retired. Uh, I've joined the FBI to help lend some of my expertise in data information sharing. A couple of things that we've found thus far is that we share a common mission, a uh, common mission that being Homeland Security. And despite presidential directives and, and other things driving us towards that, we've yet to find a true common platform with regards to how to share this information. We run across issues such as PII, which uh, will make it difficult to share information across platforms. I found it interesting that I can't share information at times with my partner, uh, DOD, uh, despite our common interest as far as protecting Homeland Security. But with that, what I have found is that there are some outreaches that are assisting with this challenge. Things such as the ISO EC 11179, which is a directive which is intent is to give a common platform for sharing metadata. Uh, metadata is the data about data. Uh, I should also tell you with the being new to this side of law enforcement, I'm also an engineer, so if I start to go off tangent, just reel me back in. But with that, being able to share the core construct is a starting point, but even with that, we still run across our, our degree of challenges. The challenges that my colleagues have brought to me uh, on my various projects in data management are the questions of the data type, the usage requirements or user requirements at times, and then com common platforms. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, the various standards that are put in place to try to resolve that. These are challenges that face us but yet have yet to be resolved. In 2005, September 2005, uh, there was a, uh, a meeting with OPJ and they came together with the, general, uh, with the Global Justice Information Initiative, and uh, they endorsed something called the, G, uh, excuse me, the GJXML. Uh, this is the Global Justice Dataset Model. This model was intended to provide a core construct for information sharing. It has lost steam since 2005, but nonetheless, I uh, invite you to take a look at, uh, at that particular entity for it provides a very strong construct with regards to how information could be shared. Some examples of information sharing within the biometric space include biometrics.gov, fbi.gov slash about us slash sieges, two locations that I would highly recommend that you visit. And um, the one wouldn't come up, so I'm not even going to give you that one because for the last two days that, that information has been down. I was going to ask you to turn to an article uh, that was produced by uh, NJI in November of 2011 with regards to sharing information on a global perspective. 
The need is greater than ever to share information amongst our common law enforcement entities. But that with that request and demand to share information, what we have found is that the sharing of information at this point has resulted in fewer case closures than prior to the sharing of information. I found that information alarming, which tells me that our sharing routines are, are incorrect. It's hard to imagine that with more information, we're able to do less, which is a bit of a challenge that faces my team and I. So as we go forward with this, we're caught with the question of what do we share, when do we share it, and whom do we share it with? Wrapped into that are a great construct of purpose. What is the purpose of sharing the information? What is the purpose of the request? So with that, as I mentioned earlier, I come to this panel to attempt to answer some of those questions with regards to information sharing. But obviously, I have quite a few questions on, uh, of my, of, I have quite a few questions that I wish you to you with regards to what we need to do in this information sharing space. I invite you to visit us at Clarksburg, West Virginia, Biometric Center of Excellence, opening our doors in 2014. With <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well, I, I am Chris Miles with the DHS Science and Technology, and uh, like my other panelists, I guess we're mostly engineers up here, so we're your egghead panel for the day. Um, I'm not a policy person, I'm not a legal person, and uh, there are representatives here in, in, the, uh, in the room from, uh, from Un United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and our legal counsel and uh, privacy advocates, and so you can imagine how nervous I am with them in the audience. Um, but they can answer a lot of your specific questions on operational applications of, of an amazing technology that we've been developing. Uh, so we are going to focus mostly on the technology, or I am going to focus on the technology, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about plans, but uh, that's not my focus in science and technology. I'll just say that up front. Um, Tony already stole a lot of my wind as we're going to talk about the information security environment and what we're providing, uh, you know, as much security as we can possibly throw at this. We've been working with our privacy office and um, I'm a co-chair on the White House uh, National Science and Technology uh, Subcommittee on Biometrics and Identity Management, and privacy is one of our working groups has been for seven years now, and we've really looked at how do we not only use or apply technology, but how do we develop the technology so that it has inherently privacy-protecting capabilities built into it. So I think Tony covered most of those. You know, we're we're going to use our our privately identity verification cards, PIV cards, and the technology that exists there. We're going to use encryptions and what exists there to to pr protect the data in the machines. Um, we're going to, you know, not include any information as what was said said earlier. The DNA we're processing does not contain medical information or uh, ancestral information or physical traits about the individuals. Um, you know, we're just excluding all of that. And we're, we're going to go out of our way to log and track how, where the data is and how the data is being shared and who has the authority to do that and, and limit it as much as possible. So, that, you know, through all of that, as well as, you know, I work in human factors division, and we know that whenever humans are involved, there's going to be errors in the data and errors in the handling of the data. So we're going out of our way through the RFID uh, on each swab and the machine reading that information, knowing which slot it was put in. When you put the, the DNA sample in the slot, it locks in there, so you can't put it in one and then move it to another one. You know, there's a lot of processes that we've been doing through the development of the technology to ensure that the privacy is, is an integrated portion of what we're talking about here as we've been developing this. Within DHS, our real requirement or the need for, uh, for DNA or the use of DNA, uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services came to us 
five years ago and said, you know, we're, we're doing all of these applications where we're trying to verify are the, cl are the relationships on this application for immigration uh, valid or invalid. And they spend a lot of time and a lot of effort to interview, look at documentation that, that exists, and try to verify is, in fact, this information correct. And um, they came to us and said, you know, we'd love for you to have a technology solution to this that can, can validate these relationships. And their, their requirement was five minutes. So they wanted that to be done in five minutes. And we actually looked at all of the other biometrics. We looked at, you know, face recognition. We all say, oh, he looks just like his uncle. You know, and to what extent is that true? You know, can we actually use that to verify relationships? And it turns out it's not very strong. It's, you know, uh, there, and there hasn't actually been a lot of studies on that. You know, the dangling earlobes, the, you know, all of these characteristics that we all say, oh yeah, these are genetic things that are passed down. To what extent could we use those? Well, you know, and blood was used to verify uh, relationships, you know, your blood typing is, is something that's passed down and the American Association of Blood Banks has established a, a, a process and a method by which they used to do that and now they use DNA for paternity validation. And then within DHS, that's really the, the background for DNA is today the application process goes all the way through and if there isn't enough information provided, then applicants can go have their DNA process today through a certified laboratory and provide that as additional information to the Department of Homeland Security. And that's allowable today, but it's at the very end of the process. So, um, you know, we looked at technologies, we looked at what was the capabilities, and we said, boy, this ANDI program and working with DOD and Department of Justice made a lot of sense to look at could we advance the technology and how far could we push it. We're not going to get to five minutes, I don't think, anytime soon. We would love to be there. The other thing was low cost. Um, you know, could we, well, how far can we drive down the cost of doing this? We in the Andy program set a goal for $100 a sample. I think we'd like it cheaper than that, but we need to look at what's the business case. Under what condition will it pay to do a DNA sample versus sending it to a certified laboratory and waiting for those results versus just the processes we do today of of doing the interviews and, and verifying the relationships through our current processes. So, um, you know, all of that is on the table as we move forward with this program. Our plans um, are to receive the prototypes, and these are prototype devices. These aren't final versions. Um, we're, we're going to be receiving the Andy system here in April, hopefully. We also have under contract uh, another company, Intigenix, that will be delivering a device to us this April. Uh, we plan to test the devices, do performance testing through NIST and um, do some operator and, and user experience testing, hopefully in the field uh, with USCIS. We, we hopefully are moving forward and working through all the privacy impact assessments and everything that has to be done to, to hopefully allow us to go out and do some DNA collection in the field. Um, you know, under very limited conditions, people that are volunteering to give their DNA at this point. Because we think they will. In a refugee camp, how many of them have some significant, you know, birth certificates and documentation to prove their relationships? So given the opportunity to say, here's the opportunity right on the spot to give your DNA and have it run. Uh, would you volunteer to do that? We believe that's the early, early cases of where we'll be testing the technology. And we'll be looking at the use of, for the operator, the, real, the realism of taking a device such as these out into the field and using them that way. Uh, what are the use cases and business cases that that works? And then we're, we're also funding the further development of going, you've, everyone's talked about the 13 core FBI uh, alleles that are used in the DNA processing. We're funding expanding that out to about 27 that uh, will allow us to go from just parent-child relationships 
to uh, grandparents and grandchildren, siblings. Um, you know, these are also uh, relationships that we need to verify. We also need to develop the, tech, the software capability to process that in the field. Uh, and today, the expert system that allows that kind of processing of those extended relationships is something that a tra highly trained technician needs to do. So to move that to an operator that can use that piece of equipment in the field uh, is something that we're working on as well. Um, so that's about all I have to say. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions, and thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Collins. I'm the Director of Forensic Science for the Michigan State Police. I uh, operate seven laboratories uh, around the state, one in the Upper Peninsula and six in the Lower Peninsula. And what I thought I would do uh, with my brief time here is to maybe take this discussion and bring it down to street level uh, for a little bit. And, and I'll explain a little bit why I think it's relevant for uh, the state of Michigan and what we're seeing. But I want to share with you something that in my travels around the state when we talk about forensic science that seems to resonate with people and I think is very pertinent to this discussion on information sharing is to compare the forensic science laboratory to something that we're all very familiar with and that is an automotive service center. And I want you to imagine taking your car to an automotive service center dropping your car off at the dealership for service and giving the technician the keys and walking away and saying, I'll be back in two days, okay? It is a necessarily collaborative business that automotive service centers work in because what happens when you bring the car in is that the technician will ask you, oh, you know, how can I help you today? Well, I need an oil change. That would be something fairly simple. But if you have something more complex, like you're driving the car and you have some wobble or vibration in the vehicle, the technician may ask you some questions about, uh, about what you're experiencing. Well, are you feeling this little shimmy uh, in idle or is it only when you're driving? Uh, do you experience it at certain speeds? Uh, do you experience it at a certain speed and then it goes away, but then you go a little bit faster and it comes back, which can help determine if it's something wrong with the wheel balancing versus something in the drivetrain. And what's happening during that collaboration between the customer and the service provider is that the service provider is trying to narrow down what is happening so that they can take their limited resources and their, li and their limited time and deliver maximum value to the customer. Because if they didn't do that, you could go in for an oil change and it could take about a week for them to figure out that that's actually the reason that you brought it in. So we operate in a collaborative business. And one of the things that you see in the newspapers nowadays is about crime laboratory backlogs. And I will, I'm here to tell you that one of the primary drivers of crime lab laboratory backlogs is lack of information in the laboratory. And the inability for the laboratory to understand exactly what the customer, what information the customer has and what the customer's actual request is. Instead, we kind of get this dunk truck effect where they bring the truck up to the lab, dump it off, and, whoosh, and, and we're out of here. Now, in Michigan, we have kind of an interesting situation. Number one, we have a governor who is the former CEO of Gateway, and he's a certified public accountant. And he places a high value on technology and information, as you might expect. The other thing is, is that recently in Forbes magazine, Michigan was shown to have four cities um, in the list of the top 10 cities, uh, the top 10 most violent cities in the United States, Detroit, Flint, Saginaw, and Pontiac. And some time ago, uh, recently, a few weeks ago, our governor, uh, Rick Snyder, announced uh, a public uh, safety, basically a public safety plan for the state of Michigan, with the primary goal being of getting all Michigan cities off of this top 10 list. Michigan also is a very, as you know, very complex border state with our Great Lakes, and we have three what you would call major international crossings, two of which in Detroit and Port Huron are major, major commercial um, crossings into and out of the United States. So this exchange of information is going to be very critical for the public safety initiatives that we're pushing very hard for in the state of Michigan. When we talk about this information in terms of 
civil rights or privacy. There's a myth that I want to dispel of right now, and I think, I think that um, the time is right for this. And that is that forensic science is not a conviction business. It's often thought of as that because of our results being used by prosecutors in the, uh, in the prosecution of cases. We are in the public safety and science business. And the early history of forensic science actually has a lot of its roots and its drivers of progress in the exoneration of innocent people. And so to think of forensic science as something that points out bad guys and is an adversarial endeavor um, really is a, is a limited view of what we do. It's not like that. We are inherently truth seekers. And I think it's ingrained not only in our history, but in our culture. And I don't think you see that in CSI. I don't think you see that in a lot of news coverage about forensic science. But it's really important to understand that that is, in the forensic science world, part of our makeup is about science and public safety, not convictions. Um, one of the things to keep in mind when we talk about the collection potentially of DNA from, in particular, arrestees, which is we're seeing is kind of what we're moving towards in the criminal justice system, is that a lot of the suspects that we arrest in the criminal justice system are not only suspects and potential perpetrators of crime, they are also at an elevated risk for victimization as well for a lot of different reasons, including their personal socioeconomic uh, situation. And when we look at some of the trends and some of the problems that we're seeing in terms of human trafficking, uh, human and particularly child exploitation, the potential of gathering th this biometric data, if you will, and collecting this at the booking uh, process of our uh, law enforcement system also produces some dividends for these individuals not, uh, that goes far beyond just the adjudication and the investigative ca investigation of the case, but also potentially protecting these individuals from becoming missing, becoming uh, victims of human trafficking, human trafficking uh, whatever it may be. It also mitigates a problem in many jurisdictions of jail overcrowding. Uh, you'll hear stories from law enforcement officials about the fact that, well, we're making these arrests, uh, I would like to be able to go into a shopping mall and arrest somebody for shoplifting because that individual may be also committing rapes. Uh, but we can't do that because we have jail overcrowding. Well, one of the advantages of DNA collection is that it mitigates that risk because it can help deliver value to that arrest uh, because of a potential DNA collection, even though that individual will not be uh, lodged in, a, uh, in some type of a correctional facility or jail. So this brings me finally to the concept of information sharing. Information sharing, as I alluded to with my analogy with the Automotive Service Center, is essentially a resource multiplier. And if you look at that Automotive Service Center analogy, we think about what we do with VIN numbers of automobiles. Even though you take it, your car in for an oil change, that VIN number of your vehicle is loaded into a database. And five years from now, when you sell that car, the buyer of that car can pull up a history and see where that car has been and, and so forth and actually delivers a lot of uh, benefits to individuals who could be at risk for the, um, at risk when they purchase that vehicle and so forth. The Michigan State Police has developed uh, under our uh, director, Colonel Christy, uh, Christy Kibietsch, who uh, is one of the first, I believe, the first state police organization to develop a biometrics and identification uh, division, which is looking at this concept of biometric enrollment at the, at the time of booking uh, for the purpose of um, collecting this information and using it uh, to improve the overall value that our criminal justice system delivers to the public. And so what you essentially have is you have an opportunity here for information exchange that delivers maximum opportunity and benefits to our citizenry really at a minimal risk of any kind of civil rights violations or misuse. Even though that risk is there, as I think Sam alluded to, uh, the risk is not a reason to abandon it as an option. It's a reason to take it very seriously and be very cautious. So uh, 
I know that in terms of the public safety priorities for the state of Michigan, the ability to exchange information with various agencies, law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, other crime laboratories, Department of Defense, whatever, what have you, really maxes, maximizes our ability to uh, keep people safe and to improve the integrity of our criminal justice system. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much for those presentations. Um, I'll start with one to uh, warm up the audience here, uh, which, um, you know, we've heard all these different approaches here in the technical and some of the policy issues and the engineering issues. Um, when you think about information sharing, um, what are the obstacles now to improving uh, the ability to share information? What are the things that you would, each of you, I'm going to ask each of you down the road, what is the thing you would change that would make information sharing work better uh, in this new technology? Um, Tony, do you want to start? Um, sure. So I'm a humble technology developer, so that's where I'll focus my comments. So one thing that I think would be useful, as, as I've shown with the system that we have developed here, we apply digital signatures to the data as it's generated or modified at each step. Um, there's no um, room in the current CMF standard, the common message format. This is uh, the, the data format that's accepted by ENDIS. There's no room for digital signatures in that standard. But that's an example where we could apply technology to track who generated this, this profile, and you can, you can make that association in a, in a strong cryptographic way. Great. Thanks. Stephen? Thank you. Uh, user identification. Uh, whom is accessing the information uh, would be very helpful with regards to uh, the collaboration uh, of data sets. Often what I've been in advised of is that we can't share that data because, uh, and it normally comes down to the rights uh, or role of the individual accessing the data. So if we had a better tra tracking mechanism across the data sets, I think that that would help improve our situation dramatically. Okay, great. Chris. Well, fortunately, uh, this last year, the NIST kind of took the lead on establishing for us um, the data sharing standard for uh, DNA and kinship information. So ANSI NIST 2011-1, Brad Wing back here is the, was the head on pushing that forward, includes now type 18 record is DNA data. Um, it includes, uh, I think there were like 40 organizations involved in developing what that data uh, envelope should look like so that the information on uh, DNA can be, can be shared. Uh, so fortunately, we have that in place. It's really a question of uh, the authorities and the, the um, adoption of that standard uh, that's in place. I think that will take a while before the community, you know, brings that on board. We'll, we'll need to, to validate that it's being used and being used correctly and that um, you know, typically we, we always have a problem with people kind of adopting the standard but twisting it a little bit to be their own unique version and then suddenly you have data that can no longer, you know, doesn't match up well. And um, obviously that can happen in DNA if we're not all processing the same DNA d information, the FBI core 13 uh, loci to start with. and and a core set beyond that. So, uh, you know, policy I think is going to be, um, you know, rightfully so, it's going to take a while before we're allowed to take uh, immigration data and, and run it against the FBI repository uh, just because that, that policy does not exist yet to, be, to allow us to do that. Um, and, you know, a lot of questions on, uh, how long we retained information for, how long we retained samples for, uh, and how long we keep that information for sharing. You know, I think those, um, you know, the, in, in truth, this is no more data than any other biometric data that we have today. And we have processes for sharing biometric data uh, within the federal government. Uh, it's, it will just be a, policies that need to be put in place to allow the sharing of that information. And, and the, you know, I don't like most of the other biometrics. DHS has reasons for keeping the biometrics that it has, 
we don't just give a copy of that to the other federal agencies. We allow them to, con to send us information that we search and send them back results. And I think that's, that's a, a distributed architecture of who holds the data and who has the authorities for that data that obviously should continue on in the DNA as well. I don't foresee us just openly giving everyone copies of the databases that exist. Chris, maybe um, I want to be clear. One of the questions I was going to ask, and then we'll see if the audience has anything, is you, we're, you're saying there's a common format for data now. Is that a – Did I am I missing? Maybe the folks from NIST want to comment on that. Yes, thing. there is. Okay. Um, And, um, and this past year, uh, the standard for the uh, interchange of biometric data was updated to include DNA information. And this is the first uh, standard for the exchange of DNA data that's um, being recognized nationally and internationally. It will form the basis for um, the exchange of uh, DNA information to Interpol, for instance. Uh, the FBI has already um, uh, uh, taking the step of implementing the XML schemas uh, to be able to uh, accept the uh, the uh, DNA information, and it does include the capability to include the uh, encryption, uh, cryptographic um, uh, reference information, the data signatures, and things like that. This standard has been around since 1986, um, and it was originally um, brought about to exchange fingerprint minutia information. Uh, it forms the basis for um, the biometric data exchange to the FBI, to the DOD, uh, for U.S. Visit. U.S. Visit is building um, their uh, DNA data repository based upon the standard, which was released in, uh, in November. So uh, it's already gaining traction, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's one place to look at. It's available. If you go into biometrics.nist.gov, and on the right-hand side, there's a button which will take you to the standards homepage. The standard is um, available to be downloaded for free. There are, um, on that web page, there's the list of the loci. It also includes uh, loci for things like family tree and, and the like, because in disaster victim identification, some people may have uh, had a DNA sample taken to establish their family tree, and so um, the medical examiners may want to uh, take a DNA sample and compare it against that. So there are other uses uh, for it as well. But look at that. There's also um, uh, some information about best practices there. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I had a question then for John. Um, you were maybe one of the more forward-leaning in talking about access to information, getting information, which I'm sort of in the same boat. But um, what information do you have now that you do, do you not have now that you would like to have access to? Do you know wh what would the ideal system look like for you? Well, I can tell you in particular uh, something fairly specific, and this is more of a maybe a little inside baseball for uh, crime laboratories, but I think everybody in this room would be shocked if you knew how much time our forensic scientists in the United States spend working cases that have already been adjudicated. <laughs> now, when you talk about DNA and latent prints, it's a little bit of a different problem because those are, in fact, that results in biometric data that can be searched, and so there's value to processing that evidence um, and, uh, and using it for law enforcement purposes in a database uh, type of a, an environment. But being able, to, being able to query databases such as court databases, uh, prosecutor databases, to find out if uh, a case has already been adjudicated. Um, this was a problem, I think, that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation many years ago started to uncover uh, when they realized how infrequently their testing reports were actually being viewed by anybody in law enforcement or, uh, or I should say, police or prosecutors. So laboratories tend to be somewhat disconnected from 
their customers' data, that being police, uh, their primary customers, police and prosecutors, although there's many beneficiaries of our services. But that's one example. And I think there's also a lot of data in uh, crime laboratories that have some type of almost uh, intelligence value uh, for law enforcement in terms of patterns and uh, the way that crimes are committed and, and so forth. So it's, uh, there's just so many disparities and we have so many different segments in this, uh, in criminal justice that I think one of the things that we have to be able to do as a community is to communicate a common set of requirements that we all need because until you develop that, you don't have a market that any business is gonna invest resources mm -hmm. to try to serve. And it's not acceptable to have, you know, 500 uh, you know, jurisdictions operating as individual markets with individual needs. And I think we have a little bit too much of that right now. Stephen, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, well, actually, <laughs> if I may, there's there's a concern that I've had with regards to, and, and exploitation is the wrong term to use, but in the private sector, there's a lot of development with regards to uh, information sharing. And there's Forbes magazine indicated that at this particular point in time, we are the most heavily uh, monitored, we are the most heavily monitored society in the history of the world, and most of it is done through self-reporting meaning that we're using quick capture devices on a regular basis, our cell phones, our PDA devices, and we have a tremendous amount of information that's out there and available. What, what I've found is that we are failing at times to use these QCPs that are developed by the uh, commercial uh, sector in uh, the government sector. We are, are not taking advantage of, of technology that's there. Uh, and with that, many of the information sharing constructs uh, that have been established. Uh, NIST is, is reading, leading the way, obviously, for the uh, government sector. But again, I, I just find that we're a little slow at, at getting to uh, technologies that are already available to us. Great. Uh, Tony, Chris, did you want to add anything? No? No? OK. Um, one of the questions I always ask now, sort of my standard question is, and particularly security came up in a few of the presentations, is, um, how do your devices, how do your databases uh, connect to the internet? And have you thought about that? If they don't connect, that's a good answer, but it's usually not the answer. So what do you, when you think about how you connect with each other, how do you do that? How do you think about security then? My usual going in assumption is that if it's connected to the internet, it's not secure, but I'm happy to be dissuaded. Go ahead. Uh, so for the current Andy prototype, um, there is no internet connection off of um, either the device or the tablet as, it's, as they're currently configured. Um, it is something we would like to do in the future. In fact, we had plans to have um, remote connectivity from the tablet mm. to DOD databases. Um, that's an implementation feature that didn't make it into the spiral. It's something we would like to do. Uh, we have some plans on how to do that securely. A lot of it is based around typical web implementations, things like transport layer security and, and um, cryptographic um, certificate um, credentials. Um, but that's not something that's in the current prototype. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we serve on both sides. Obviously, one side of the FBI house does not connect to the internet. The other side connects uh, the IFS databases available. We use LEO as a platform for common communications with our law enforcement partners. Yeah, I don't work for US Visit. That is our uh, DHS repository for the biometrics information that exists today. But, um, you know, they have, I think, 40,000 plus users of uh, that information and provide, uh, you know, secure access to the information for all the different DHS cu customers within Coast Guard and. Uh, Customs and Border Protection and USCIS and Immigration and Customs Enforcement and um, you know there's DHS is a large um, data system of information sharing and you know our our needs there we almost refer to it as um, as um, screening of individuals because we we talk we touch so many humans every single day uh, going through airports and uh, the seaports and, and um, all around the country and, and world that, um, you know, we have 10, 30, 10 to 30 seconds to make most of our decisions 
on um, whether or not someone gains access to the country if, if that person is who they claim to be. Uh, so our, our system has um, kind of, you know, in the world of forensics where you're taking lots of time to, you know, validate a decision that's going to make, be made, we're on the, the polar opposite of that where we have to very rapidly provide additional information to an officer that's making a, a determination on the spot. And um, DNA definitely is, um, is a slower process than that and that's where we're still kind of determining what's the appropriate use cases for it and its current uh, capabilities within DHS. There's no issues with internet uh, connectivity for us, but I think from a public policy standpoint, it's going to be something that's going to be increasingly, um, it's, it's an emerging area of interest, I think, to be, to say the least. Okay, great. Uh, go ahead, please. May I just make a um, comment? About communications, and a lot of it, and sharing information, a lot of it will depend upon interoperability of systems, and the best comparison is to compare CODIS and APHIS. CODIS works great because they had the vision from the beginning and built the system from the bottom up so everyone could communicate. I, APHIS and IAPHIS are a mess. Jurisdictions can't communicate with each other. They have different vendors. Uh, the encoding uh, process is different. So it's a very, very traumatic experience to try and search the databases you need to search in APHIS. So the comment is for purposes of if you're designing new things, you've got to design the interoperability of various vendors and using NIST to set the standards for the communication from the ground up. Then you get something like CODIS, which is tremendously uh, effective. So it sounds like in the case of this data and this technology, maybe building off the experience of APHIS, they managed to get things a little, little closer to being right. Is that fair? Well, yes, if they actually knew what the problem with APHIS was, which not many people really do. Yeah, you want to so, tell us? <laughs> well, no, that's okay. No, that's if you had three hours, I could tell you, but you don't have that. <laughs> we have a question over there. Yeah, kind of along <clears> the same <throat> lines uh, with, with interoperability and standards. We talked mm. a lot about technical standards, but as uh, I believe Mr. Miles uh, briefly mentioned earlier, you also have this issue of separate systems that are being shared, but you don't share the, you don't, you, don't, you don't just combine the systems, you share the system or allow use of the system for, for an external agency or for a different agency, and in that way you keep the information compartmentalized. But is there any discussion on methods in which you can ensure that the proper rules, essentially, for all of those various systems actually travel with that information? in that if I am at DHS and I'm using a DOD uh, system to screen against or to run through, how do I ensure that the correct uh, protocols, procedures, and protections for the system that I'm using are known to me who doesn't use that system every day? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, very good question. Um, I think, you know, that there are so many different laws and so many different rules that those all have to be taken into account as you de design the architecture. And I think you can design architectures that, that maintain um, that level of information. Are, are we doing that today? I don't have enough insight into the information systems uh, that exist. I, I, I'm kind of working on the, the devices um, that provide that information. Um, but you know that that I think I think you your question is a very good one and uh, something that we we have to be doing at the information uh, access level. Um, you know the I know the well I won't speak for the FBI but they do that today uh, with you know ensuring who can who can send information and who can uh, search the data and get you know who can get results back. So it's lots of policies and operational and training and, you know, all of those things that have to take place. Okay. Stephen, if I remember correctly, you said the Center for Excellence was going to open in 2014, but I thought there was already a big university program out there and a big uh, FBI data center and some other activities. Uh, 
I, you know, I already thought of you guys as the sort of national hub. Is that, was I? Uh, yes, we are the national hub for fingerprint information, <clears throat> and we do have several shared systems as well uh, on the campus. When I refer to the opening in 2014, that is with regards to the BTC, the Biometric Technology Center, which will be a center that will specialize in training of, of latent print uh, activity. It will also uh, oh. specialize in the introduction of new biometric uh, devices. Quick capture platforms will be doing hopefully some DNA work out there. So it's a new center that we're opening in 2014, an expansion of the current campus. Okay. What will you do when it comes to uh, merging fingerprint and DNA data? Is that something that... Well, that's, that's currently one of the major challenges we're, we're looking at. Um, the APHIS system, as, as was mentioned, is problematic. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we are making strides forward. Um, I, I'd rather not, not speak into any level of detail, but we do have the Dazzle Lab, which is giving us a bit of a construct that we can operate against uh, forward thinking. We're taking a look at some other common strategies. Um, OMB Max would be one particular common uh, sharing platform that we're looking at. So there are certain uh, advanced technologies that we are looking at, but I, I don't have any details I can provide at this time. Okay. Did we have other questions out there? Can't, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Just had a question about uh, kind of the architecture for sharing information across agencies. Talked a lot about kind of information sharing within respective agencies, but as we kind of move to a more global model, uh, do we think it's going to be more of a kind of a central repository where all data is located in one place and everybody searches it uh, from their own respective organizations, or is each agency going to maintain their own kind of federated data and that's going to be globally searchable, searchable across all? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, as I said before, I think it, it, it does depend on the authorities that are, are granted to each agency. We don't have the, uh, the personnel or the staff to run information for the entire federal government, nor would, nor would we intend to. Um, and, you know, except in some case, specific cases, you know, I think the National Counterterrorism Center is in charge of of helping us to identify terrorists. Will DNA become a repository there of known uh, terrorists and, you know, along with their other biometrics? Uh, I don't know of a plan to do that today, but it would make sense to me that for known individuals that we're trying to, tr that we as the entire federal government are trying to track down, uh, that the processes that we use for uploading current biometrics to that system should apply for DNA. You know, we, we currently each have uh, processes by which we say this is a known terrorist or a, a possible threat or, you know, each of the different categories of persons that are uploaded to that national database. Um, but that's a very specific, very limited number of people that go into that into that kind of category um, and are, are highly reviewed in doing so. Um, you know, then, you know, for DHS purposes, you know, I, I cannot tell you today that we will be creating a, a DNA repository within DHS. We, we have not had an agency come forward and say we absolutely need that, you know, within most of our applications, we're going to do the familial relationships. We're going to get a, is that valid as the application is, is uh, valid or not? And uh, we're probably going to print out a report and stick it in their file, and that may be the end of it. Um, you know, I, I believe down the line there will be other applications that come along that would would need uh, DNA within DHS applications, but today we have not had uh, the operational components come forward and say, oh yeah, we need a national repository for DNA. Um, so, you know, there isn't, it, although it's a very small bit of information and not, you know, n there isn't much to share there, um, you know, the sharing of it's going to be the easy part compared to all of the policy and the, the rules by which it can be shared and when can it be shared and collected even. One uh, comment, maybe it relates peripherally to what you're saying, but I, I want to make sure it's, it's mentioned, is that one of the things that we're also talking about here 
is really the introduction of a massive cultural change in law enforcement. If you talk about uh, the criminal justice community of the United States, is that you're talking about a paramilitary culture or military culture, if you're talking about Department of Defense, that uh, is traditionally very command and control. And we are introducing at a rapid pace high technology and science into this culture. And it is not an easy transition. Um, and that's, those things are really hard to, those are the intangibles. And I think that the, for example, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, IACP, uh, they, they have a, a, for example, a forensic science committee. Um, they have an award named after August Vollmer, who was a huge proponent out of uh, UC Berkeley back in the early 1900s about uh, elevated professionalism or technology science and policing. And um, it, it is a, it is, you just cannot understate uh, or overstate how, how significant this cultural change is. And it's, it's gonna take time but it's something to pay attention to. Um, Tony, when you uh, were thinking about when you and, and Paula were among the people working on this, what did you think in terms of law enforcement, domestic law enforcement as a customer? Did that enter into the design thinking at all, or where did that fit into what you were doing? So there is some thought that a system like this would be deployable at booking stations, at local police departments. Um, but I think there's a whole infrastructure and, and even policy issues that need to be addressed before something like that actually happened. I see Tom Callahan has something to add to that. Oh. Fifty-four of those, the state labs, the Army, the FBI, uh, Puerto Rico, and Elizabeth, who's the other one? Oh, there's, there's, uh, and D.C., Washington, D.C. There's 54 points of entry for convicted offenders and arrestees. So all samples are collected and have to go to one of those state-level uh, state laboratories. Um, with rapid DNA machines, we are looking at initially hundreds if not thousands of ports of new portals to be able to come into the national database and in in having the a a, uh, a non-dna person be involved in collecting that sample and putting it in the machine that machine you can think of as a fax machine or an entry portal uh, the results will still be viewed at least are uh, concept will be, will be viewed in one of those 190 laboratories. The laboratory who has the unsolved case gets the message that you have an unsolved case, you have an, un, an open case, and here's a DNA profile that is, has been associated with that case. So that's the, the use case, and then this would get at the uh, backlog problem. Those 54 labs can now concentrate solely like the other uh, 126 labs in the country on crime scenes, and that should uh, help reduce the backlog. So that's the use case for domestic law enforcement is to uh, put the portal, uh, follow the fingerprint, uh, the fingerprint model where the fingerprints booked in the, or is collected at the point of arrest, and the DNA will be collected and analyzed and uploaded at the point of arrest. And one other thing, Ken, to, to uh, there's a reason that Pete Vallone and I are sitting next to each other, Pete from NIST and the FBI. So uh, we have learned from the APHIS issues and uh, in all of our requirements, compatibility not only with, uh, with the FBI but uh, standards for the CODIS core, but with the international standards are, are being applied to these uh, machines. Great, thank you. Let me ask the panelists if they have any final thoughts they want to share on this. Any, maybe we could ask them about the work, how does it work between state, federal, and local? I left out tribal. Um, any final comments you want to make on this? No? I, I'll make just a real quick one. I, I've had the opportunity to work in the federal government, uh, two state uh, agencies, and also at the local level. And it's amazing how similar the problems are no matter what level uh, you move through um, in terms of information sharing and, and so forth. Back in 1996, when I was with the ATF, we had the bombing of the Olympics uh, in Atlanta. 
and then a series of serial bombings afterward by Eric Rudolph, who was later captured in North Carolina. And, and that was a great example in a very high profile inter, of international significance, high profile case that where you, where you see the benefits of the potential benefits of really good, solid information sharing and how quickly it can go south if you don't have it. Um, Chris? Well, I, I'd just like to say thank you for the, holding this panel to the DOD and to CSIS. Um, you know, that we need to really carry on these kind of discussions because I, I gave a presentation about a year ago at a conference and, um, you know, talked about, you know, I think we're talking about real necessary uses of the technology for help to help refugees, to help asylees, to help in, you know, prevention of human trafficking, slavery, um, you know, these terrible things where DNA can be a benefit to stop these fraud cases, the crim crime, the, you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential good use for the technology here. And then the next day, you know, in the news it was run that, you know, starting this summer we were going to collect DNA on everybody going through airports. You know, just total <laughs> fraud, you know, on what I had said versus what was presented in the news the next day. So just to be clear, <laughs> we're, we're not going to be starting to collect uh, DNA at airports. If no, in. we're not. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a real problem that we have today that the, the perception and the, the privacy issues and the, you know, what's being said in the media <laughs> is so... 180 degrees out of what we our requirements or our restrictions are uh, things that we're doing to protect the the privacy of individuals uh, and the restrictions we have on how we can share data and and how we can use it uh, that that's not getting out there I think the previous panel said that as well and I, I don't know how we do that more effectively uh, we we obviously have to because uh, the, the, there are the concerns and there are uh, the misperceptions that are taking place in huge ways. You know, the next month of my life, there was 30,000 postings a day on the Internet, you know, <laughs> describing these misuses of, of how we were going to be using DNA. And, you know, I, we, I spent, you know, innumerable hours and FOIA requests and things that per followed on after that, uh, explaining, you know, our, how we're really going to use it. And uh, we're still supporting the program today, uh, but we, we have to, at, at every turn, be ready to answer those kind of questions and, and carry on this dialogue. So I, I think this was a good forum today, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. A crucial point, uh, Stephen. We've spoken a lot about uh, the potential, uh, often focusing on some of the negative con content of, uh, of data and information sharing. I was uh, interviewing one law enforcement person who indicated that CSI is my best friend but my worst enemy. <laughs> They've indicated they go out into the field and because I've seen it on television, every investigator should be able to pull a fingerprint off the ceiling of something that was <laughs> thrown up and touched the ceiling. But, but with that, I have to candidly say that in my limited time here with the FBI, I've seen the collaboration of information between all uh, agencies, DHS, DOD, uh, and DOJ in particular. And in addition to that collaboration of information, the use of new technologies that will allow us a multimodal approach, be it using partial uh, information from a DNA swab, uh, facial recognition, fingerprints, et cetera, pulling information from multiple data sets to, to solve various crimes or prevent various activities from happening. I've been very impressed as an outsider coming in. So despite the fact that we've indicated there are several challenges with regards to information sharing, I believe that the horizon is very positive. The technology is out there. I think we have all agreed as panelists that uh, policy is more a restricting factor than is uh, technology. So with that, I just wanted to close on a, a note of saying thank you. And uh, as a newcomer, I'm, I'm very impressed by the work that's being done by our law enforcement personnel, our war fighters. And I'm just happy to be a part of trying to solve the puzzle of getting this information to a point where it's readily available on a quick capture uh, platform. Anthony, you get the last word. Excellent. So um, I'd like to thank uh, 
for the, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I'd like to echo a little bit what Stephen just said, that this, this technology is in its infancy. I think we have a lot of policy issues to work through. That's above my pay grade. But I am very interested in talking to people offline after this um, about other use cases that they might have for DNA and for their security and their analysis requirements. Um, we shouldn't look at this as a finished product. It's a fantastic prototype. It does amazing things. It does things that two years ago I would have bet were impossible. Um, but here it is. It exists. What can we do with the next version and the next version and the next version? That's the discussion I'd like to have. Okay, thank you. Well, join me in thanking this panel, please. <clears throat> I'm, I, I'm also happy to say that I don't have to sum up what we've done here today, that that uh, responsibility falls on Ken. <laughs> I'll try to sum it up. I, uh, we did make a change in the schedule, so we did move up lunch because after looking at this thing, it's like, we have lunch and come back to closing remarks. Who's going to be? Who's going to be there? I'll be talking about myself or something. So, so we, so so now I'm the last thing holding between uh, holding you up between uh, us and lunch. So really, I thought this was a very fascinating discussion in a in a forum that we had, just to get to hear some of the things from uh, the need for these biometrics and forensics technologies and how it's it's really not going to go away. If anything. Um, Biometrics and forensics, from my capture, really goes uh, multiple mission applications, not just law enforcement. There's some intelligence applications, there's medical applications, counterterrorism, protection of the homeland. It's, there's a lot of things that it touches and it plays with. And really, this is just the beginning of uh, a lot of new efforts coming out there. Because the way, the way we look at it is we got to get information quicker and faster to the individual collecting it. The answer needs to be at that person rather than going back through laboratory systems and get the answer six or seven months. Ideally, that's where we'd, we'd want to go uh, to push technology to do those types of uh, um, turnaround times and with reliable information so people can make decisions and act upon the information that they're collecting. So uh, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Jim Lewis and uh, Katrina out here and uh, some of the helps and CSI for hosting and organizing this activity. I know CSIS. it's uh, CSIS. Did I say CSI? Okay, well. It's a bad word on this panel. Okay, that's right. That's almost like saying DHS is collecting DNA and what? Oh, and send, oh, and send all the privacy questions to DHS since they're well experienced with that. So if there's, if there's any freedom of information requests, I, Chris is going to take that on for us. So, so that's great. But, but speaking of that and how we help each other out with that kind of stuff, the, it's really the need for collaboration. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to, to look at a, a box in the back and it produces DNA results, but we, we just scratched just some of the earf, uh, surfaces that the collaborative effort of the, in this particular case, the Andy Steering Committee started several years ago. And th this stuff really takes a lot of time. It's not only producing a piece of equipment, but you heard some of the pri privacy issues, the policy issues, information sharing, there's requirements, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into this. And it's not just about putting money towards that. So it's, it's these activities of leveraging those existing organizations within the U.S. government to develop some whole of government approach uh, to address all those various issues because there's experts throughout the whole of U.S. government to do that. And I think we, we hit the mark pretty good uh, with uh, the rapid DNA effort and, and trying to prevent those things that we encountered with the fingerprint identification system. So it just goes shows the power of your federal government and, and a lot of other expertise in the academia and the industry uh, to do so, to something great like uh, this particular effort. Uh, we talked a lot about policies. I probably got a list of 35 policies we probably got to look at at least to make sure that we're not ignoring, but there was some really good discussion. We do appreciate these types of forums like Chris mentioned. Um, it's good to get these inputs uh, now uh, because the more you know about the issues and problems, um, if you know them three years ago, you can start building systems like this, understanding that you need to have these particular control measures or these security features and things like that. So these types of environments are very helpful for, for folks like me and, and other members of the steering committee to, uh, to understand as, as we push technology into the future. Um, 
And of course, always, always being mindful of the rights and privacies, that's really at our forefront. I mean, the, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. We're all trying to do the right things. You know, we're trying to depend on what your mission application is. We're not really interested in the biomedical information behind this, not this community and the, and the other communities that we're involved in, but uh, certainly um, interested in protecting the privacy because we are U.S. citizens just like, just like others. So, so again, I found this fascinating. I want to thank uh, all the panel members. Uh, Mr. Riley, Dr. Pominoski, and, and others. Uh, Mr. John Boyd for uh, actually giving us some resources to do this particular event. Thank you very much for that. And uh, enjoy lunch. Until next time.